Well, 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 good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome to another Sunday evening broadcast. Welcome to Grow in Wisdom, Grow in Wisdom. My name is Sean, and uh, I am the Wisdom Coach, uh, with a passion to help the people of God grow in one of three main areas. That's in relation, uh, in areas of relationships, entrepreneurship, and uh, spiritual growth and development, personal development and spiritual growth, right? So those are the three main areas. Uh, Sunday evenings, what I seek to do is to tackle the subject of wisdom for relationships, wisdom for relationships. Well, today I am going to deal with a topic that I am hoping will be uh, helpful uh, to all involved, right? To, to men specifically, first and foremost, uh, but also to women who desire men in their lives and women that are married to men that are that there are men that you need to pray for. And so my topic today is going to be entitled Prophet, Priest, and King, Prophet, Priest, and King, The High Calling, The High Calling for Christian Men. I want to begin by apologizing for making my announcement so late. I just decided about two hours ago, maybe three hours ago, what time I was going to go live. Uh, I usually try to announce a day or a few days before so that uh, so that you have ample time to get yourself ready and prepared. But I'm hoping that even if you miss the live broadcast, that you'll be able to come back and watch this later on on YouTube uh, or uh, even here on uh, Facebook. Right. And so, again, welcome to Grow in Wisdom. I am the wisdom coach. And uh, again, that passion is to seek to help you today on Sundays to grow in wisdom and the areas of relationships. The Bible says again in Proverbs chapter four and verse seven that wisdom, wisdom is the principal thing. That means it's the chief thing. It is the thing that you and I should pursue. And over and over the Bible says that we are to, we ought to get wisdom. Wisdom is something that we need to go after. Wisdom is something that we need to understand and we need to pursue. Matter of fact, the Bible says at least four times in the Proverbs to get wisdom. Listen to where, to how it's stated in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 4, 5 says, get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. What, so it implies that wisdom can be forgotten, right? Get wisdom, get understanding, and don't forget it, right? Don't forget it. Proverbs 4, 7, which is what I quoted earlier, says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. And then in Proverbs chapter, uh, looks like Proverbs 16, 18 says, how much better is it to get wisdom than gold? How much better is it to get wisdom than gold and to get understanding rather, uh, and, and to get understanding rather to be chosen? It's rather to be chosen than silver. So this is a good time to invite a friend. This is a great time to share with others. Uh, Shireen, it's good to see you. I uh, did get your message about um, moderation and uh, I hope to get through that this week and uh, get you set up. And thanks for the, uh, you know, for taking the initiative there. Proverbs seventeen eighteen says, Wherefore is there a place, a price in the hand of a fool to get wisdom, seeing he has no heart for it or to it? In other words, why would a fool desire wisdom since he or she has no heart for wisdom? So wisdom in the Bible is the opposite of making, of being a fool of, or making foolish decisions. And part of growing wisdom beyond the focus of helping God's people to grow in areas of relationships, entrepreneurship, or all things financial, and in the area of personal and spiritual development, the, the chief idea is to help us to avoid foolishness, foolish people, and to get better at making, you know, to stop making foolish choices or foolish decisions. <coughs> all right, so that's uh, that's my basic um, preliminary uh, introduction. Uh, I'm still getting myself set up here. Faye, it's good to see you here as well. And uh, I just want to make sure that I can see everybody that's coming in, wherever you're coming in from. 
uh, I don't want to miss opportunities to uh, to uh, to interact with you. Feel free to leave your comments in the chat. Uh, feel free to leave those comments. I'll be open to following them as much as I can. I have a lot to cover. And so again, my topic today is uh, prophet, priest, and king, the high calling for Christian men. Uh, in the future, I am going to deal with something probably along the lines of the uh, Proverbs 31 woman, right? And so uh, I want to say if you are a female, uh, there's going to be some things here that's going to be relevant to you. Number one, if you're raising sons, you want to know what kind of son you want to, to develop, right? If you are married and your husband does not have the qualities that we're going to be identifying today, then you want to be praying for him. The goal of this is not to bash the men around you, not to show, the, show where they fall short, but to hopefully be praying for them because you have a responsibility uh, as a travailer, women, women, to help birth them into the kingdom, birth things into the kingdom, right? God has uniquely wired you as a woman to be connected to things, right? And to people in such a way that you don't let things go unless or until you see or get the uh, outcome that you desire, right? And so we see that in Jeremiah chapter nine, when Jeremiah desires to, when God wants to create brokenness and humility and mourning and weeping and wailing among the people of God, because Israel had become so hard, God told Jeremiah, I want you to call for the travailing women. And as they wept before God, as they cried out to God, it broke the hearts of many in the nation. And so women, you have a unique way of doing that. Grace, mercy, it's good to see you. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. Faye, it's good to see you here as well. Again, I want to apologize to any of you for the last minute notice. Um, you know, my desire is to go live every when, every every Sunday evening. I just am not sometimes not sure what time I want to go live. And so I did send that out a little bit late. I should have done it from yesterday because I knew what topic I wanted to jump into or deal with tonight. So um, I hope that uh, those who want to get this information will have access to it and be able to get into it. But uh, this topic is going to be for the whole body of Christ, everyone. And I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm going to seek to show you tonight why this is relevant and uh, and the things you should be praying for. So my goal with this topic is to make it a two-part. My goal today is to deal with part one, and Lord willing, next week I'll deal with part two. There may be, may be a part three. I don't know. We'll see. But here is the topic again. Prophet, priest, and king, the high calling for Christian men. The high calling for Christian men. Now, I want to say at the beginning that uh, Jesus is identified in Scripture as our prophet, right? Our priest and our king. We'll talk about what that looks like, what that means. But I also want to say that as a child of God, if you are a Christian, you also have been called as a prophet, priest, and king uh, to the, the environment that God has called you to. So we'll talk a little bit about all of that and what that looks like and why this topic is not only relevant for men, but it's relevant for the body of Christ in general. But I believe that men are the keys to God's world. That men, you are the key to God's world. That as go the men, so go the home. So go the church. So go the nation. Right? You've heard it said that as goes the family, so go maybe the church and so go the nation. Maybe you've heard it said, how go, you know, how goes the church, so goes the home, so goes the nation. I want to say, as the men go, the direction the men go in, right? That has everything to do with the results you and I are going to see. And uh, another thing that, um, that, that I want to share that you may not have thought about, that um, you can tell the state of a society by the debauchery uh, and the, the lack of shamefacedness among women, right? When women are not bothered by things that women used to be bothered by, right? Uh, then then you, you can tell that that, that society has degenerated uh, to the lowest of lowest levels. All right, so where did this topic come from? Yesterday, I had the opportunity and the privilege uh, to speak uh, to a group of 100 plus people in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, the topic that I was asked to speak on was this. I was asked to address, even though it was a general setting of mixed men and women in the audience, I had the privilege. Uh, there was a woman, a woman that spoke before I did, and she, got, she had an opportunity to address the women, even though the men were present. I was asked to address the men. And whenever I speak somewhere, I always want to make sure 
or make what I speak relevant to everyone that's present, right? Not just to the not just to the men, even though I was called to speak to the men. I knew that women would be present, so I wanted to make the topic practical enough that the women would not just feel like they're just they are taking up space. All right. So um, I'm not sure why you're dropping it too, sis, but I'm glad that you're here tonight. Uh, Nakeem says, we got the keys, the keys, the keys in my DJ Khalid voice. Yeah. Yeah. Men are the key to God's world, right? Men are the key. All right. So I may talk a little bit about more of that, but that's that's not ultimately a focus. But yesterday I had the opportunity to speak at this uh, church, this conference, this group. Uh, it was a long day, 10 to 3. And um, and again, my job was to speak on this topic of of how men are uh, to to lead in the home. And so I chose prophet, priest, and king to take the example of how Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and a king to us. Uh, that's God's desire for each one of us <clears throat> as men and as saints. And so that's going to be my topic today, and this is where it was birthed. So let's begin by saying, when I say prophet, priest, and king, I want you to think of three simple things, right? We're going to define these more. We're going to get into how Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and a king, how every child of God has been called kings and priests to God, and we are to, pro we are to be prophets in the sense of speaking the word of God. But specifically, what does it look like or what should it look like in the home? All right, so as prophet... As prophet, we must speak God's word. The prophet speaks God's word. A prophet gets God's mind, God's word, gets the understanding of God's word, and then speaks God's word to others, right? So the prophet speaks on behalf of God to others, all right? All right? I want you to think of that idea when you think of prophet. Think of teaching. Think of instruction. Think of calling people to repentance. Think of holding people accountable. Think of exhortation, comfort, instruction, admonition, warning. That's what the prophet does. Generally, the prophet is not so much concerned about your feelings. The prophet is not worried about what you think. The prophet generally is going to err on the side of truth, not grace. But Jesus is not just a prophet to the people of God. He is also a priest. And as a priest, the priest has a tendency to err on the side of grace. Why? Because the priest is standing in the gap between God and the people. The priest has the role of intercession, right? As a priest, the man must intercede on behalf of his family. As a priest, the child of God must intercede on behalf of others. As, of others. as a priest, Jesus is our great mediator. He is described as a great high priest. And he stands between God and man, right? And so he represents us to God. He stands in the gap as an advocate. And this is what John means when he says in 1 John chapter 2, my little children, I write these things that you sin not, but if you sin, if we sin, if you sin, if anyone sins, we have an advocate, we have a mediator, we have an attorney, we have an intercessor, we have a priest. Jesus' priestly office allows him to stand in the gap for you and I so that he can represent us to God. And now, John says, we have an advocate with the Father and so that our sins can be forgiven because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. So as a prophet, as prophet, a prophet's going to speak the word of God to their center of influence, to their environment, to the world in which God has called them to right? Whether that's a mother, whether that's a teenager in school, whether that's a father, whether your role is pastor or church leader, whatever the role is, maybe you're a business owner, right? If you're a child of God, you're called to that prophetic office in one sense, not the office, but the gifting I'm going to say, right? And so we're going we're to apply this to men specifically, but I want to keep talking about it in a general sense so you can see how it applies to all of the people of God, right? So the prophet must speak God's word. The priest must intercede on behalf of others. And then thirdly, the king, the king, as king, the king must govern according to God's rule and law, right? The king must govern according to God's rule and law. So who is this broadcast for? Who is this broadcast for? Well, if you are a Christian man, or if you are married to a Christian man, or if you desire to be married to a Christian man, this broadcast 
will establish what you should be looking for and what you should be praying for. Some of you are married to men that are not prophet, priest, and king in the home. The goal of this broadcast is not so that you can condemn them. It's not so that you can look for another man. It's so that you can pray and believe God and hopefully expose that man of God to information so they can pursue the higher calling. Okay? All right? So you have a responsibility to pray for them in that manner. I want to encourage you to do that. All right? And so <clears throat> this is for men, Christian men. Secondly, it's for women that desire Christian men. And it's for women that are married to Christian men. Right? But it's also for Christian women who are called to speak, to pray, and to rule over their own lives and to have influence over the lives of others around them. So in that sense, every child of God is called to be prophet, priest, and king. So all saints are called to be prophets, to be priests, and to be kings. And I'll give you some text of scripture to establish that uh, shortly. All right. Matter of fact, <clears throat> the Bible says in Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So this is the saints before God from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, right? All ages, all genders. There's only two genders, by the way. And then it says in verse 10, And God has made us, or Christ has made us unto God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So every child of God is called to reign. Every child of God is called to pray and to intercede. And every child of God is called to speak. So in what sense is every child of God called to be a prophet? Well, Jesus in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, in verse 19 and 20, this is a call to every child of God. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. In that sense, you have a prophetic call on your life, not to prophesy or to foretell the future, but to forth tell what does God say? What does God's word say, say already, right? Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them. Everybody that you teach, Jesus says, to the 12 or to the 11, because one had already betrayed Jesus. Everybody that you teach, I want you to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always or all way, all the way, even to the end of the world. So Jesus says to the 12 apostles, the 11 apostles, I want you to teach the people the things that I've taught you. And what I'm saying is. If they're to teach people what Jesus has taught them, then we are to teach the people what they have taught us. And that cycle continues. So every child of God, not just those who are called to an office as pastor or church leader, but every child of God is called to go and make disciples. The Greek idea is in going. It doesn't mean that you go to the mission field. The idea is wherever you are going, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Be prepared to make disciples, to teach all nations wherever you go. First by your life, then by your words. And so every child of God is called to speak God's word to those areas of influence that God has called them to. All right? All right? The Bible says also in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, that we have a priestly ministry because it says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So every child of God is called to consider one another and to provoke one another to loving good works and to exhort one another. These are not suggestions. These are commands. It's one of the 1,050 commands of the New Testament. And so in that sense, every child of God is called to be prophet, priest, and king. So what's our goal today? What do we want to accomplish today? Well, my goal today is to focus on what does a man look like who is pursuing 
the high calling of prophet, priest, and king. Again, the title of this broadcast is Prophet, Priest, and King, the high calling for Christian men. The high calling for Christian men. When I hear high calling, I hear the highest standard. Not, I don't hear the only standard. This is not to condemn those that may not be at this level. This is the highest calling for the man, which is to follow the example of Jesus. See, Jesus is a prophet, a priest, and a king unto us. And Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. All right? So goal today is to focus on what does a man look like as prophet, priest, and king in the home, in life. And then, Lord willing, next time we're going to focus on how do we develop and implement the qualities of a prophet, of a priest, and of a king in our own lives. First as men, specifically, and then as children of God, more practically and more generally, right? So I have a question for you as we begin. When you think of prophet as the one that speaks God's word to their environment, their, play, their domain, their place of calling, you think of priest as the one that prays for and intercedes on behalf of others, again, that are in that same domain, environment, their place of influence, their place of calling. And when you think of king as governing according to God's rule, God's laws, my question is, which of these three, <clears throat> which one of these three do you think, which, which, which one of these do you think is most emphasized in the Christian home? Prophet, priest, or king? Or let me ask it another way. Which two of these do you think are most neglected in the Christian home? Speaking of God's word, praying for the family, or governing and taking dominion over the house, ruling the home, whether that's the finances, right, getting the kids to school, whatever ruling looks like. I want to hear from you. Which of, which of these three, what two do you think is most neglected in the Christian home? Prophet, priest, or king? Among men. Which two do you think is most neglected? The role of prophet? Do you think more men act like priests in their home? Christian men? Do you think more men act like prophets in their home? Or more men act like kings in their home? And what are the two that you believe are most neglected in the home? And I believe many of you will get this correct. And this is part of the problem of why our homes are not as mature spiritually, as influential and effective as we could be. All right? Nakeem, you seem to be the only one that's dropping an answer. Nakeem says he believes out of the three... Prophet and priest is the most neglected in the home. Uh, Shireen says, I believe the two most neglected is number three and number one. So you think prophet and king is neglected. You think most Christian men or families pray for their families. They don't teach them the Bible as much, and maybe they're not ruling as God commands to rule. Phil says it's tough. I'd say prophet. They leave other men to teach their women and their children. Agnes says prophet and priest. Uh, let's see. I believe king is one of the ones neglected because it speaks about how in godly marriages, they are sometimes uh, tied with, with worldly affairs. I don't know that I fully understand what you're saying. I think I do. I believe king is one of the ones neglected because it speaks about how in godly marriages, they are sometimes tied or tied to worldly affairs. I think I think you're saying Christians are unable to rule in their homes in the right way because there's worldliness and carnality in the heart and in the life. All right. So I'm going to I think that's what you're saying. Uh, Agne, uh, uh, Angie says, I think in today's society, the king rule is neglected. Um, all right. I believe king and priest. All right. So you guys, I thank you for playing along. I think in most Christian homes where men are. Men have some understanding that I am to have dominion in this home. 
right? You'll hear a lot of Christian men say to their wives, you need to be submissive to me. Make sure you be subject to me. And there's this idea that the role of the man is to lead and to rule and to govern. Now, it may not be as God says to govern. It may not be according to the law of God, which we're going to get into. But I believe the two that are most neglected in the Christian home, from my experience, is priest and prophet. Now, many of you know that I have five children, <clears throat> and my three older children have all, for some part of their life, gone to Christian school outside of homeschooling. And so going to Christian school allowed them to connect with a lot of their Christian friends, which led to bringing their friends to our home, and sometimes for sleepovers, because I and mo mommy did not like our children sleeping at other kids' houses because we felt we had no control over what was happening over there. So we would say that if you want to have sleepovers, the kids, your friends need to sleep at our home. Well, what we did often is we would invite a lot of these children to join us for family altar, family devotions, our time of prayer and reading of the scriptures. And I can't tell you how many children said in their own home, first of all, this was the first time they had been exposed in, their, in a home where someone is actually opening the Bible, singing songs of worship to God, praying over the scriptures, teaching the word of God, many of these children said that did not happen in their homes. And so and to realize that many homes are depending on the church to develop their families. And many men or leaders in the home are not being prophets and priests to their families. And so I believe from my limited experience and my limited research that the role of priest and prophet is the most neglected role. Probably king, king is one of probably the most misunderstood roles. I would say the king role is probably one of the most misunderstood, but priest and prophet is probably the two most neglected. And so what I hope to do today is to help you to have a better understanding of what it means for Jesus to be our priest, our prophet, and our king, and how are we as men, first and foremost, to follow his example as prophet, priest, and king, how to have a right understanding of headship, what it means to govern and to rule in an environment, in a manner that honors God, and I'm going to give you a nugget of wisdom. I'm going to give you a hint. If you are ruling without the priestly right garment and without the prophet mantle, your rule is not going to be balanced. It's not going to look appropriate. It's not going to be as effective. If you are wearing the prophet mantle and you are speaking the word of God to your family, to your church, to your workplace, to your environment, but you lack the governing role, right, as king, and you are not operating as a priest. See, as a priest, there is empathy, Jesus, as our great high priest, is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. And so when this is not married to ruling or governing, then it doesn't look right. It's rigid, and it can often be legalistic, and it creates rebellion in the home. Right? In an environment where children are only given rules and dogma and instruction, right, which lacks prayerful support, which lacks empathy and coming alongside, it will not produce the results. And so I'm going to tell you from my own limited knowledge, and my conviction is this. I've met a lot of people who say, I have my children, I met people who say I've been raised in a Christian home. And I've met parents who said, we have a Christian home. And sometimes these conversations go this way. The Bible says to train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. I've raised my children in the fear of God. I taught them the things of God. Our home was a Christian home, and they still didn't follow the Lord. And so the people start questioning the text of Scripture. Now, any of you that were part of my teaching on what are uh, Proverbs, Proverbs are not promises. <laughs> Proverbs are not promises. But a proverb can give you a truth that you can trace throughout the Scriptures and I don't need Proverbs to tell me, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from it to know that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. All right. So <clears throat> I want to say to you that I've met a lot of people who said they had Christian homes, but 
uh, as you went deeper, you saw there, there was no teaching of the Bible. There was no husband teaching his wife the word. There were no husband and wife praying together with an open Bible, singing and worshiping God together. Why? People said, we're too busy. We don't have the time. Or I've heard men say, my wife doesn't want to pray with me. I've heard women say, my husband doesn't want to pray with me. There is really the husband sitting with the, or the father sitting with the wife and the children, opening and breaking the bread of life together and praying and worshiping God right? And seeking God on behalf of the family. And so we're going to talk about that. Job did that with his family and his children were grown in their own houses. All right. So I believe the prophet and the priestly role are probably the most uh, neglected, right? You'll see what I mean by priestly. See, if you think of the priestly role only as praying for people, yeah, I would say in, I would believe that in most homes where there are Christians, prayer is something that we're doing. Why? Because Jesus says, when you pray, not if you pray, prayer should be a, 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 a normal part of the life of the child of God, right? But that kingly role, I think, is very well, very misunderstood, very misunderstood. And there are a lot of men who are head, who take dominion, who rule, but it's not done in a manner that probably uh, generates love and support and respect and people that want to follow. Notice that Jesus said to those men, he said, follow me and I will make you fishes of men. They were very comfortable to follow Jesus's leadership, right? They were comfortable to do that, all right? So uh, let me jump through some of your comments. Then I want to pray and uh, we're going to dive into our topic. First, we're going to look at how Christ is our prophet, priest, and king. And then the call to men, the high calling, the high standard. Every man of God should desire to be this in their home and in their family. OK, and then woman, if you're a woman and you're not married, this is the kind of guy you should be looking for, praying for, desiring. Right. And if you are married and your husband's not this, <clears throat> then praise God that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, God can turn hearts wherever he wills. God is able to turn hearts. And so I would encourage you to pray for that man that God would turn his heart. All right. I want to look at some of your comments here. Uh, let's see, in most homes, all faces, all are neglected. Their hearts can sometimes be worried with worldly affairs. Okay, I got that. Agnes says, Sean, most men don't pray fervently in most homes. They have left that role to their wives. I would agree. I would say in most, in many homes, in many homes, depending on the denomination, right? And depending on the denomination, typically when you get into the charismatic movement, word of faith, non-denominational Pentecostal churches, generally speaking, the women are more spiritual than the men are in those circles, right? Because most men are not emotional, right? Um, unless they've been, only been raised by women, right? That's a side note. And I've been raised by a woman. I don't see myself as very emotional, but uh, in some ways um, I can be, right? And that in and of itself is not a negative. By that, I mean, a lot of times women will go to churches and choose a church because of the emotion going on, the worship, the loudness and the music and everything else, right? If they feel emotionally moved, they think the spirit of God is there and this is a good church. Generally, men are not wired that way. Men tend to want to be in churches where their brain is being engaged, where their heart is engaged from a place of reason and logic and teaching. And so I've seen this over and over and over again as men and women are choosing churches in their home. The woman wants to go where there's good worship, good music, uh, you know, and, and so on. And the man wants to go where maybe there's not as much of that, but I want to go where the truth is preached. And um, and so sometimes in certain circles, uh, those circles, women learn in that emotional envir environment how to pray effectual, fervent prayers, where in a more traditional conservative, not by politics conservative, but by religious conservative setting, the men tend to pray a little bit more, you know, Father, we thank you. You know, it's it's not as emotional. It's not as affectional and fervent. So I'd say most men don't pray fervently in most homes. Uh, I would say that would fit for certain denominations. And then there's other denominations like Reformed and Calvinistic, Reformed Baptist, uh, 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 Covenant theology. There's certain uh, there's certain parts of the church where 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 uh, homeschooling and motherhood and fatherhood is overemphasized, right? 
Uh, hospitality is critical, inviting people into your house. Don't forget to entertain strangers where they're thought, taught on a regular basis that family altar is important. This is how I learned to bring a family altar into my home. I didn't learn that in the Pentecostal church or the Assembly of God church or the Word of Faith or Charismatic church. I learned it in a Reformed Baptist church where I would enter into the homes of other families and they would open the Word of God and pray after a meal together. And that's how my wife and I begin to add the family altar to our home on a regular basis. So I guess I would say, depending on the denomination, some 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 denominations uh, understand this mandate and responsibility and they approach it more. Brother Ian, it's good to see you. What day did you do devotional time having four kids playing sports? We have neglected this. Yeah, thank you, Ian. Ian is one of my good pals, my good buddies. Good to see you, Ian. Uh, yeah, I appreciate your transparency, man of God. Uh, I would say this, that, um, you know, Joshua says in Joshua 24, he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so I want to encourage you, Ian, after today to, to, to do this every day with your family. Here is why I say that. Yesterday when I spoke in Brooklyn, um, I asked the people of God, how many of you, how many of you, Pray for your children. How many of you try to teach your children the word of God? And people raised their hand. It was a full room. And uh, how many of you think parenting is difficult? And people raised their hand. Parenting is extremely difficult. I said, <clears throat> I'm going to make the case to you that parenting is a million times more difficult than you think it is. And of course, I said that for a fact. And then I told them why. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, that we are to hide the word in our hearts, and then we're to teach the word diligently to our children. And when and when, when and how are we to do this? When we rise, when we lie down, when we go in the way, right? God says that we're to teach our children from morning until night, right? And I made the case that because God commands that, it tells us how difficult it is to change a heart, how many competing voices there are, to steal the hearts of our children away from God. So let's look at Deuteronomy 6. Ian, I want to share this with you and with others uh, before we dive deeper. Guys, feel free to drop other comments, right, other questions that you have. I'm not going to rush through the topic. If this has to be a three-part, it'll be a three-part. I want you to notice what God says here. Verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. We'll come back to this text later as we deal with the prophetic role. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. And then notice, first, you have to love God. And then you have to know God's word. You have to hide that word in your heart, right? And then God says, and then thou shalt teach them diligently. Diligently is the opposite of being lazy. You have to be intentional about this. This is not going to happen without effort. This is not going to happen without blocking out time. This is not going to happen without scheduling it. I'll answer your question, Ian, in a moment about how frequently we did it. But I want to go to the scriptures first before I told you what we did, because I don't want to guide anyone's conscience with, with what we did. I want to guide your conscience with what does the word of God state? Thou shalt teach the word diligently to your children. Notice. And you shall talk of the word when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, that's when you're driving in your car, sit in your house is when you are in front of the television, when you are eating a meal together, when you are playing board games, my family was just playing Monopoly, right? All of these are opportunities to speak God's word to our children. By that, it doesn't mean you say, hey, Deuteronomy 6, 7 says such and such, no. To teach the word diligent to, diligently to our children means we must have enough knowledge of the things of God so that we can apply the word of God to our life. And so not too long ago, one of my children confessed that they stole something from a department store, like a um, lip gloss, lip balm. Okay. And they didn't when they shared this, they said it happened a long time ago, but the way they talked about it, they didn't talk about it like it was something they were grieving over, they were lamenting about, they were shameful of. The person felt like it wasn't a big deal, it was a long time ago, right? So there was an opportunity for me to 
follow Deuteronomy 6, 7 to show, well, here is how you should be thinking about that. And here is why you should be concerned about that. And then I encouraged the person. I said, you need to pray. And they said, well, what should I pray about? Pray that God would allow you to see that as stealing, not because it's a small item, but how does God see it, right? That's an opportunity for growth. So God says you should teach these things diligently to your children. You should talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. From God's perspective, from morning until night, the people of God should be teaching the word of God and the things of God and the law of God to their families. That's why I say it's a thousand times or a million times more difficult than you think. Because most parents in America, Christian parents, my limited knowledge, believe just getting my children to youth group, getting my family to church on time is sufficient to counteract the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I want to say you cannot put your kids in the school of Nebuchadnezzar for six or seven or eight hours a day, five days a week, under the influences of the world through entertainment, through TikTok, through Instagram, through YouTube, through all that comes through our through our, the online networks as well as our devices. It is impossible to have all those influences over our children and and it's enough for them to go to youth group, youth group and then to go to church. Right. And this is sadly why so many professing Christians studies tell us, Barner tells us that many children, when they hit the age of 18, 19, 20, and they go off to college, even though they were part of Awana, even though they were part of youth group, even though they were part of all the kiddie stuff that took place in the church, they were part of Sunday school hour and so on. And they learned about David and Goliath and Samson and Delilah and so on. They turn away from the things of God once they hit college. And and the studies believe that they turn away because the influences are so great. I believe they turn away because the, because the foundations were not deep enough. Notice God says that this work is so hard that I want you to take that word of God and I want you to bind it for a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. In other words, create reminders for yourself. God says... You should write them on the post of your house. Put up scriptures all through your home. Put them up in your bathroom. Let your children, let your family see the word of God is important to you. Don't put up pictures of Bob Molly and pictures of Biggie Smalls and Tupac. You're saying to your family unconsciously, this is who and what I worship. I don't have any pictures of any athletes on my wall. I don't have any pictures of any entertainments. You will not find Michael Jackson on my wall. Why? Because what we see, we desire. What we, what we see enters our hearts. God says we're to guard our hearts. Why? For out of the heart flows the issues of life. God says fill your house with scripture, with the things of God, with inspirational messages. Why? Because it's seeing those things over and over and over again. Repetition is the mother of retention. All right? So back to Ian's question. What day did you do devotional time having four kids playing sports we have neglected this thank you again brother for being transparent uh in our home i would say for the most part we've sought to have our devotional time together five to seven days every week that meant that every day i and as the last few years of my wife's life I had devotions with her and I had with the children. So for many, many years, maybe the last eight to 10 years of our marriage, I would pray with my wife every day because I found Ian that made her a better wife. I found that if my wife got busy during the day that she may not, enter, she may not go and feed on the word. And so as a king in my home, I have a responsibility to go ahead of my family as prophet, priest, and king. And I would encourage my wife, let's read the Bible together. Let's pray together. And even though I had my own devotional time, I would have time with my wife. And then I would block our time. Generally, we would try to and seek to have our devotional time, Ian, after our meals. And so in our home, we, we committed, we made it mandatory as much as possible that as a family, we would eat together. Right? Why? The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What is why, why is that important? We don't know our children unless we get them in environments where they're talking. 
This is how parents can raise two Columbine killers and they don't really know them. Why? Because the average teenager and young person today spend all their time in their room, spend all their time. They don't eat with their families. They go into their rooms and do their own thing because families, my parents and my family is too boring and my friends are more important than my family. And if you're going to be a prophet, priest and king in your home, man, you have to establish boundaries and environments. Listen, your family is eating from you. You're feeding them. So you should be able to create the environment when we're going to eat and how we're going to eat. And in my home, we made it a point as much as humanly possible that all of our family, it didn't matter what they were doing unless they were working. This gets harder when people start getting jobs at 17, 18, 19 years old. But for the most part, up until they were at the age where they were working, we would block out time to read and pray together on a daily basis. It wasn't always easy to do, Ian, but we saw it as a major priority. And so we did it on a regular basis. So what I would say, maybe what you want to do the next season I think there are so many parents that carry a burden and a responsibility that my children need to have it better than me. I think it's one of the worst philosophies of parenting because I struggled, right? Financially, I want my kids to have a lot. Because I wasn't able to play sports, I want my kids to play more sports. Because I didn't have enough friends, I want my kids to have more friends. I want to tell you that that philosophy is bad, it's unbiblical, and it creates entitled Children who lack initiative, who often at times will be disrespectful to their families and their parents and can even end up being children who, who at some point kill their parents. You say, man, you're dramatic. Yeah, there are children who get to that point where they attacked physically even their own parents. <clears throat> so you never want to raise a child in an environment where they don't understand pain, difficulty, suffering, self-denial, discipline. Right. And so what I would say is if devotions becomes priority for your home, then that means something has to give. Right. And so in our home, what we sought to do, we said to our kids, you can pick one sport and one. Right. I wanted them all to do something, something in music. Right. Uh, all of them at some point did the piano um, and then uh, people kind of veered off into different things. So I, I think a lot of parents carry unnecessary burdens and having their kids do three and four and five sports or having all their kids do different types of sports. And it's very difficult to keep up, right? Because most of these sports, here's the truth. Most of these sports are on Sunday, right? And it's not a coincidence. You think they're on Sunday because that's when everybody's off. No, it's on Sunday. It's the enemy controlling the, the agenda so we can keep you out of the house of God so that that day doesn't become a priority for your home. Let me, let me, Ian, let me take you off so it doesn't seem like I'm addressing you at all of this. This is not... This is not so much for you. This is for everybody. All right. So so that's a great question you asked, brother. Uh, much love for you. Uh, reach out to me if you think I could be of any help uh, to you in your journey. Um, let me just check out a couple more of your comments. I'll run through this quickly. Shireen says, please don't forget to hit the like button. Um, let's see. 1 Corinthians 7.33 says, but the married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, right? And his interests are... Uh, and his interests are divided. That is why I thought King was more neglected. Yeah, I would say, again, uh, the context of Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 7 is that um, uh, they are under severe persecution. And Paul is admonishing the unmarried to stay unmarried because things are so difficult. And if you get married, you could either end up dead and cause sorrow for your family or you could or you could lose your spouse. Right. If you're a woman, your spouse, your husband could be killed or, or both of you. And now you leave your children there. And so because of how severe things were in the first century, Paul encouraged and admonished the saints to remain content in whatever sphere they found themselves. So that's the context of his words when he says the married man is, quote, distracted. I'm going to paraphrase from the things of God. And now his focus is on his family. I'm going to tell you as a married man, my distraction was not the things of God. I learned through wisdom how to delegate. I find that I get more done with having a family than if I was a single man without children. Why? Because I leverage my family to do a lot of things for me or around the home. Right? So what Paul is saying, I think there's some context that should be given. But the general idea is when you're single, generally you have less distractions from God's work in God's kingdom. Father, help your people to speak your truth, 
which is your word, help us to take watch in prayer for the body of Christ and to help us to do what is right in your sight. Very well said, sis. Very well said. Uh, you know, a lot of people are just starting to come in. And so that's a, a lot of reason why I delayed getting right into my topic right away. Grace and Mercy says, I think what was stated by Brother Phil, how a lot of men leave other men to be the priest and prophet over their wives, which is not right. I believe uh, Grace and Mercy believes that's true. Yeah, I believe that that there are many men that don't understand they've been called to this high calling of prophet, priest, and king. That's why they leave that either to the wife or they leave it to the school or they leave it to the church or they leave it to the youth leader or they leave it to the police officer or the governor or the government. And uh, and we miss our opportunity to bring greater glory to God and see God impact our world. Uh, as Shireen says, I see a lot of emotional men in the NAR movement. I don't know what NAR is, sis. Everything is mainly about experiencing the presence of God and not much teaching and preaching of the word of God. NAR, is that something like uh, the charismatic movement or word of faith? Um, I would love to know what NAR is. But uh, yeah, um, there are movements where there's so much emotionalism that a lot of these things are neglected. Sylvia says, hello, good to see you here. Jereen says, doing well. Okay, you guys are just saying hello to each other. I just want to make sure I don't miss any questions if they are here. Um, give me a second to just go through any more of your comments. Brother James, it's good to see you here tonight. I see you shared my post. Thank you. Uh, and so thank you. If somebody comes to this because of you, I want to say thank you, brother, in advance. Uh, Shireen says, amen, day and night, night and day, just as prayer is of utmost importance, doing those times, so is spending time in the word of God. Yeah, the way the Bible deals with God's word is we should be meditating on the word of God day and night, right? It should become a part of our everyday living. Uh, but it also deals with prayer the same way. It says pray without ceasing. That means when you jump in your car, you should say a prayer. It means when, you, um, when you're when going to have a meal, you should pray. When you feel afraid, you should pray. When you are working on a project at work and you feel confused and you're not sure what to do, you should stop and pray. We should acknowledge God in all of our ways, right? And so we want to make these things more of a way of life than a responsibility or a duty or an obligation where it loses heart and it only becomes head and rigid. Right. So so as I share what I'm sharing, I don't want you to think of this role of prophet, priest and king in the home as, OK, this is just something I'm to do and I'm just going to go ahead and do it. But I do want you to think, men, it's not a coincidence that God saved the whole house of Lydia, that God saved the house of Moses, that God saved the house of Joshua, that God saved the household of the Philippian jailer, that God saved the household of Abraham. These are not coincidences. God says, I chose Abraham because I knew he would command his family, I'm going to paraphrase, to serve God. Joshua says, Joshua's not asking his family what they want to do. Joshua tells his family what they're going to do. Why? Because I provide the food here. I provide a bed to sleep in. I provide the Wi-Fi that you have access to, to that internet, that I can't get you off when I need you to do your chores. Right? So you and I have more leverage than we think we do, and we have to exercise it. And this is where the king comes in because you are to govern. And this is where the prophet comes in because you're not being moved by feelings. You're not being moved by what people think. The prophet's going to speak truth and love regardless of what people think. It doesn't matter what your feelings are. We're going to say what God says to say and uh, deal with the, you have to deal with the outcome. All right. Again, this is all my introduction. All right. Uh, Phil says, that happened to me. I went to Catholic school as a Baptist, but never had a deep understanding. Still questioned God until later in life. Yeah, yeah, it's so true. Most schools are not teaching the Bible as they should, right? Even if they're called a Christian school, right? You should never depend on someone else to feed your own soul or to feed your family, feed your children. Grace and Mercy says, sadly, a lot of men don't have issues with the king part, but in the priest and prophet where, where the issue where the issue is, and actually the roles are reversed, where women are doing these roles. Yeah, it's very sad. That's why I felt before I get into what men or what women needs to be need to be, since men, in my view of scripture, men are the key to God's world. They say that if a man follows God, there's a 90% chance the whole family will. Well, if the man in the house is on fire for God, there's a 90% chance the whole household would love and follow God. If the woman's on fire for God and the man is not, there's a 10% chance that the household will follow God. 
Maybe that's why the devil does everything he can to get the man out of the home, to destroy that man manhood and masculinity. Marcy, it's good to see you here. Glad that you are here, sis. Thank you guys again for your comments. And you keep dropping them. And so I do want to pray, but I but I but I but I want to make sure I see all your comments and I don't want to miss anything. That's just how I roll. Michael says, stumbled on this stream randomly as someone who's getting married later this year. This is really helpful teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for being here. I'm glad you stumbled on it. I do believe God is sovereign and he orders the steps of his people. The Bible says the steps of a good man are, quote, ordered by the Lord. So uh, I, I appreciate the language of stumbling. That's your way of saying you didn't intend to find this. You didn't know who I am or what the cast is. But I'm going to say if you desire, Michael, to grow in wisdom, Wisdom being the most important thing in God's world. Proverbs 8 and 9 says Jesus is wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says Christ has been made unto us wisdom. Wisdom is something we should pursue. And so many of God people make foolish decisions, foolish choices, and hang around foolish people, which wrecks our lives, destroys our homes, destroys our marriages, destroys our finances. Even though we're declaring this is the year of Jubilee, the year of harvest, or the year of something, I felt the call to create an environment where, by God's grace, I can share some of what God has been teaching me. And so I'm glad you're here, brother. I'm going to be sharing some stuff as to why you should desire to be a prophet, a priest, and a king to that woman you are seeking to marry. And she should understand what that role, what those roles are, what it looks like. And this will create a best environment for you guys to have children. I'm assuming if you're a man of God, your desire is to have children, God says, to be fruitful and multiply. Sivir says, I wish my husband and I had invested more time in family devotions since I now see the foundation I thought we laid was it deep enough. Thank you, Sister Sylvia, for being transparent. There are a lot of parents that are realizing, you know, that 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 um, Salvation Army, Awanas, um, a Sunday school hour, and all the other things that we thought was enough, the youth group leader who was charismatic and played volleyball with the kids and went bowling with the kids and did all this nice stuff to keep them occupied so that I can have a life. Many people are now seeing that it's not enough to just teach your kids about David and Goliath and Jonah and Samson, right, and Moses. What a lot of children's churches and youth groups do is they turn these radically transforming stories that are supposed to teach us how to love God, how to love people. They turn it into little ditties for children. It becomes little, uh, what's the uh, what's the cartoon? What's that? What's the cartoon thing with the characters that they made for uh, Veggie Tales? And so Veggie Tales has taken over America and it has dumbed down the word of God for children. So now all of our children are being entertained and we think entertainment is how they learn about God. As long as they go to church and have fun, praise God. I'm telling you, no, that's not how the Bible teaches it. When you read the Old Testament, there's no children's church. There's no youth group. They gather the little infants and all the ages together to sit under the word of God. What's the benefit of having your children in the service? Accountability. When the children hear what you hear, they can hold you accountable. Mom, dad, didn't pass to say such and such. Secondly, we all get to learn together, grow together. Thirdly, you have content that you can go over with your family. Now, by saying that, I'm not saying anything's wrong with youth groups in general or children's church in general. I'm saying the methodology, the philosophy is flawed that children, the mindset that many preachers and pastors and churches have, which is children can't learn the Bible unless it's fun. Children can't learn the things of God unless you play games with them and give them candy. This is not biblical. I've often said to my children, there's no kitty hell. There's no children's hell. <laughs> right? When God destroyed the people in Noah's day, when he, God brought the flood, he didn't take time to take the babies out. Only eight souls were saved. Everybody else was destroyed. God didn't take time to take out all those people that you say have not reached the age of accountability. Right? God didn't say, let's take all the 12-year-olds and under and put them on the boat. Because they are so innocent 
Let's protect them. No, from God's perspective, Psalm 58 verse 3, the wicked go astray from the womb speaking lies. David said, in sin, my mother brought me forth. I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity, right? And so the work is very hard, very hard. And uh, I want to encourage you guys to go deep as much as you can. And again, this doesn't have to be long, guys. We're going to get very practical, Lord willing, next time. I'm going to talk about practically what you could do. But guess what? You could you could block out 15 minutes a day, 10 minutes a day with your family. You could choose to, uh, like, to, maybe you just decide, we're going to have a, a, a memory verse per day as a family. What does that mean? That means today we're going to read Philippians 1 verse 6. We're going to talk about it. We're going to ask questions. What does it mean to you? What do you understand? And then we're going to commit to memorize it. And then we're going to pray as a family. And if you did that for a year, that's over 300 texts of scripture that your family have learned. Even if you did it every other day, that's 150 plus scriptures. If you did it every three days, it's 100 plus scriptures. If you did it once a week, that's 50 plus scriptures. In, in five years, your family knows 250 verses of the Bible, which is probably more than most Christians in America know. Yet God says we're to hide God's word in our hearts, right? We're to memorize the word. All right, so you don't need a lot of time. All this idea that we have, I need a lot of time. You don't need a lot of time. You need greater priority. You need to understand the value. You need to understand the benefit. You need to understand what does it, what, what does doing this, how does it help my family to get to heaven? How does it help my family to be better? All right. So NAR is, is the new apostolic reformation. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Yes, it's very much like the word of faith in the charismatic movement. Ian says, brother, my family is listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are nailing. You're nailing our life. <laughs> well, be encouraged, man. I, I'm not trying to be condemning in any way. Life is hard, you know. Um, life is hard. I didn't grow up with a father, so sports wasn't a big thing for me, right? Because I didn't have a father around. I, I'm not a. I wasn't a big sports lover. And so having one son, it wasn't a big thing in my family. All of my kids played basketball. The girls played basketball. My son played basketball. Uh, I think they all played soccer. But we, but, but they had to choose one sport a year, number one, because I didn't want to drive me and mom crazy that we're up and down dropping people everywhere, and then we can't build our marriage. See, guys, you got to walk in wisdom. Here's what happens to most parents. What happens to most, and I'm generalizing, there's always exceptions to the rule. If you're hearing the exceptions, don't hear anything I say. Just, just focus on the exceptions. Uh, if, if all you can see is the exceptions, what I'm about to say is not for you. Just do this. But for others that are able to hear the spirit of what's being said, not the letter of what's being said, here's what I would say. Many of us as parents, we worship our children. We over-prioritize our children. And the first priority in the home should be the husband-wife relationship over the children. That means you should block out time for you and your spouse and if that means we, our children have to do one less uh, instrument or one less activity or one less curricular thing or be one less group because we want you to be part of all these things so you can get into college, we're going to make adjustments. Why? Because the most important thing, people of God, is to get our children to heaven. Spurgeon says the the thing that he says nothing's greater than, Troy, what's that quote? Getting to heaven than taking someone you're with you? Spurgeon says, nothing's better than going to heaven than taking someone else with you. Right? Oh, what's better than going to heaven is taking someone with you. All right, that's the saying. All right? So, Ian, thank you, man. Your feedback has helped me to help others, I hope. Uh, let's see. Nicholas says, question, are there prophets in today's church age similar to Jeremiah, or did that position cease, also including the position of apostles. So there's four types of apostle in the Bible. There's Jesus, the apostle of our profession. There's no more of him. There are the 12 apostles. There's no more of them because Revelation says they laid a foundation for the new Jerusalem. Then there's apostle, which has the idea of sent one in Greek. Those are still in existence. There are people that carry the title apostle but in order to be an apostle, biblically speaking, like the second one I said, you would have had to seen Jesus ministry and seen him resurrect from the dead. That's why Paul says, I am an apostle unlike any other 
in due time. This is why once Judas betrayed Jesus, they didn't just raise up a woman to be an apostle among them. They cast lots for another man to take Judas's space or place. That man was called Matthias, Matthias, and you never heard of him again, right? So that is the foundation of the church. The book, the book of Ephesians says the church is built on the foundations, the foundation of the prophets and the, the apostles and the prophets. The apostles and the New Testament prophets, or the prophets and the, the Old Testament prophets and the apostles. Okay, so that, that second variation. I think the third example is all of us are sent, right? So in one sense, every child of God is a sent one. Now, the third version are those who God has gifted and called to plant churches. I believe those are still in existence today. Many of them don't carry the title apostle because they understand that is a unique office and designation, but get, again, today there are people in certain movements, they love titles, and they believe titles make the man, generally, or make the woman, and so they treat titles as, they treat offices as a title. This type of person will never let you, you have to call them pastor. Even if you're not their pastor, you have to address them as pastor. That person doesn't understand pastor is an office, they see pastor and a gifting. They see pastor as a title, and they want you to call them by that title, bishop, pastor, apostle. So there's four types of apostles in the Bible, Jesus being the great high, uh, the, uh, the apostle of our profession. Then there's the 12. Those two are done away with. They have laid the found, you know, the, the 12 apostles have laid the foundation of the church. I believe there are those who are gifted to plant churches. They have an apostolic gift. There is a gift of apostle, which is different from the office of apostle. There's a gift of a prophet, which is different from the office of a prophet. Do we have Jeremiah's and Isaiah's today? No, that's an office of prophet. There are those who have the gift of prophet that hold an office as prophet. They go of a prophet. They go to schools for prophets in charismatic churches, word of faith churches, but they're not prophets like the prophets of Old Testament. Why? Because those guys created scripture. There's no prophet today that creates scripture. There's no prophet. This is why the Bible says, don't despise prophecy, but it says, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, right? Jeremiah's words, I didn't have to prove Jeremiah's words. Jeremiah's words became the word of God. I didn't have to test Isaiah's words. They became the word of God. A gift has to be tested. The office is a function that God has called someone to. And when God called Jeremiah to the office of prophet, when people didn't listen to what he had to say, it could cause their death. And so the prophet and apostle, there's you have to understand the difference between a gift and an office. And sadly, so many today don't understand the difference. So are there prophets in today's church age similar to Jeremiah? No. Are there people who think they're similar to Jeremiah? Yes. I don't have time to fight with them, argue with them, debate with them. If I'm you, remember 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if someone identifies himself among you as a prophet, remember that God says you're to be a Berean and you're to test all things and hold fast only to that which is good. By implication, the majority of the prophecies you will hear under the new covenant will not be true. And what are you using for the test? One standard, that's the word of God. So the word of God is more important than prophecy. The word of God is more important than giftings. All right. So second part, did the position cease? I don't believe the gifts have ceased. <laughs> Offices are different from giftings. There are many that I love that are in my circles that believe the gifts have ceased. My favorite teachers and preachers of history believe the gifts have ceased. But they're wrong. I don't see the devil's power getting greater Right In the end, in the last days, and God's power is more diminished. And God is only, God is only concerned now about saving souls. All right? That's the mentality of this group. All right? There's no greater miracle than to save somebody. And so praying for people to be saved is more important than praying for their healing. No, that's not biblical. Jesus says, what's easier to do? Say, take up your bed and walk or your sins be forgiven. From his perspective, both are important. Both demonstrate that he's Messiah, that he's the anointed one, that he is the Christ, that he's been called by God. His miracles demonstrate that his word is true. 
And Paul says, when I spoke to you in 1 Corinthians 2, I didn't come with wise words of man's wisdom. When I spoke, there was demonstration of God's power. Why? Because it wasn't just words and nice theological stuff and nice sounding words. And I got big, big words, right? No. The power of God was present to change marriages, to change homes, to change families, to heal bodies. And so, Nicholas, I believe the gifts are still for the day, though I believe much of the charismatic chaos is not the gifts of the Bible. See, so you got to hold truth in tension. When someone hears me say, I don't believe the gifts have ceased, their mind immediately goes to swinging on the chandeliers, slain in the spirit, rolling around on the ground, and barking like a dog under the Toronto, quote, curse. They call it a blessing. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. If you walk into church and people are barking and doing all sorts of stuff and acting like animals, and you think that's God, you better run. You don't know your Bible. And you definitely don't know the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God is gentle and he's easily grieved. And foolishness is, the Bible says, the thought of foolishness is sin. Foolishness is something God avoids. Why? Because God is wise. And when people are doing foolishness, the Holy Spirit leaves. Because he's not the author of confusion. He's the author of peace. Wherever he is, there's going to be a peace peaceful environment. I'm not saying that somebody won't dance and their clothes fall off. Thank you, David. But it's not going to be confusion. God is not the author of, author of confusion. So hold those truths in balance. Some hear peace. And you know what they hear? That means people shouldn't be clapping in church. You know what they hear? That means there shouldn't be any dancing. God says dance before the Lord. I'm going to dance before the Lord. In this church in Brooklyn I was in yesterday, they were dancing and praising. And guess what? I was dancing and praising. Why? Because the church was filled with people from Africa and people from the islands and people from down south. And so guess what? They tend to be more, a little bit more emotional than your Europeans. So if you're going to create a theology that's only European-centric, then don't be surprised if it doesn't draw the people who are wired a little bit different when you look at the rest of the world. So I'm glad. I'm grateful that heaven will have every tongue, every tribe, every, every, every nation is going to be represented. All right? Ian says, my daughter, saving, just said, Pastor Sean is better than David Jeremiah. Oh, wow. That's nice. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I like David Jeremiah. He's a little bit old, right? He's a little bit old, a little bit outdated. No, he's not outdated. He's a cool guy. But praise God. You know, I, I try to speak with passion if I agree. And and uh, Ian, how old is your daughter? That's great. That's encouraging. Um, tell her to, you know, well, you, you reach out to me. Let's connect. We need to do lunch, dinner or something. The came says, no wonder the devil be trying to jack fellas up, right? It's not a coincidence. And God's grace the men in here will be the prophets, priests, and kings of our families. Amen, brother. Let's declare it right now and let's believe it. One of the reasons I'm teaching this, and I see now it's going to be a three or four part part uh, um, study, is because men, you are the key to God's world. God says a home without a man is an afflicted home. James 1 verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God is to visit the fatherless and widow. What do they have in common? No male. Visit them in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I can go through the Bible and show you that when God bring, moves men from a society, that society is destroyed. When men become feminized, when men become like women, the society goes downhill. Men, you are the key. So there are big bullseyes on you as men. The devil does everything he can to destroy you. Jacqueline says, I also come across this channel, and there is so much substance in, your in the teachings. Well, thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you for being here. Please share the word. Spread the word. You know, I'm trying to be a help. We meet every, every Wednesday night uh, at uh, 8.30. We meet Eastern Standard Time for what we call Your Questions Answered. And that means the people of God come with questions, and we just seek to answer them with an open Bible. It's a very unique Bible study because your questions could be about money, Bitcoin. It could be about investing. It could be about building a business, about parenting, about marriage, about spiritual warfare. It could be about theological stuff. It could be about systematic theology. It could be something as simple as what is justification? What is sanctification? What is regeneration? What is Calvinism? What is Arminianism? It doesn't matter. The Bible answers everything if you know how to rightly divide the word of truth and then apply that to your, your uh, area of uh, life. All right. So that's Wednesday nights. Uh, on Sunday nights, we do wisdom for relationships. My channel is called Grow in Wisdom, and God has given me a passion to help God's people grow in three main areas. Entrepreneurially, I believe every child of God in America should have more than one stream of income. 
Guys, don't wait for the recession to hit for you to wake up. God says, wake out of slumber. Don't be asleep. The sons of Issachar knew the signs of the times. They knew what was coming before it got there. And every child of God should have an ear to what's going on in America and in the world and in the West. So that right now, this is a time to redeem time. This is a time to turn off Netflix, to turn off the stuff that's not building and strengthening you and put time into not only building yourself, but creating something more for you and your family. Why? Because a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So my passion is to help God's people grow in the area of finances or entrepreneurship, turn your gifts, knowledge, hobbies, experience into more revenue. Why? Because hard times are ahead. Number two, my passion is to help God, God's people grow in the area of relationships. Relationships we do Sunday nights, right? So all the topics on Sunday, on the Lord's Day, generally the banners will be red. Why? It's Some of you probably didn't know this. The red banners means that it's about relationships. The, the, the orange the orange slash yellow are my daily nuggets of wisdom, which I tend to drop daily, right? So subscribe to the channel if you are blessed by the content of any kind. And then the uh, Wednesday nights is uh, your questions answered. At some point, I'm going to do uh, more green, which would be uh, helping God's people in the area of finances. But uh, I also have a Patreon group for those of you that want to go deeper. And I just want to say while I remember that uh, those of you that are part of our Patreon family, that we'll be getting together, Lord willing, tomorrow night on Zoom, right? That's a lot more interactive and uh, it's a lot more intimate than this setting. And uh, it's pretty unique. Uh, we're right now going through reasons why God's people fail in different areas of our life when we have so much access to God's wisdom and God's truth and so on and so on. So uh, Lord willing, we'll be gathering tomorrow night at 8, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you're part of our Patreon group, you should have got a message yesterday or today reminding you of that. If you haven't received it, please check the app uh, so you can be a part of that. And sure. Shireen, uh, I'm going to ask you to drop the link for our Patreon group, if you don't mind. Some people may want to join. Uh, all the previous uh, gatherings and teachings are there. So even if you missed them in the past, you can still get them. Uh, James says, what scripture or book of the Bible to start with in order to do daily devotions with my wife one-on-one -on -one and my two daughters as well? I thought I was already on par, but 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 I see I need this teaching. Yeah, thank you, James. I will say <clears throat> the best book I think to start with is the book of uh, Mark. Many people tell people to start with the book of John, like if you're a new Christian and so on and so on. I would not start with the book of John. Uh, Mark Mark was the, uh, the first book written in the New Testament. Mark shows Jesus as a servant. Mark is going to build your faith in not only who Christ is, but Mark is going to remind you of his power because it and Mark is like a newspaper uh, a rendition of the scriptures, right? Over and over, it says immediately, 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 right at that moment, right? It's filled with that language where everything's happening really fast. And so it's very engaging. It'll keep track. It'll keep your family engaged. And here's what I want to say, guys. If you're going to do devotions with your family, you don't have to try to get through a whole chapter in a sitting. You can go through three or four verses. Right now, I'm teaching the Bible to somebody and we're going three or four verses at a time, Right? Here's a nugget of wisdom. You just have to be a little bit ahead of your family to teach them. If you want to be a coach, you just have to know a little bit more than the person you're charging. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be certified. You don't have to go to somebody else's school and somebody else's certification program so you can start generating revenue for yourself. And in the same way, if you're teaching in your family, you get up a little bit earlier, uh, James, than your family, and you study out the text and three or four verses, and I would read just a small section. And then what I do, let the family, let different people in the family read the verses, right? My 10-year-old reads a lot slower than the 14-year-old, right? And, uh, and so we have to take a little more time, right? And so I've had to make adjustments on how we do devotions. When I have the older children, it looks different, right? And so there's no hard, fast rule. The key is being consistent because repetition is the mother of retention. It's not how much we do. It's how consistent we are in doing it. That's most important. So if I were you, I would start with the book of James. I mean, the book of Mark. And then I would go maybe uh, to the book of Deuteronomy. Right? I would, go, I would go Mark. Then I would go Deuteronomy. 
And then I would go to the book of Proverbs. One of the things I do with my family is we read Proverbs together uh, daily. So I don't want to put too much demand on any of you. But the book of Proverbs is a good book to read together as a family because it gives wisdom and prudence and discretion to the simple. If you want to stop your children from making stupid and foolish decisions and having for everything from terrible twos to adolescent issues, which none of these are identified in the Bible, all right? Don't believe in any of them. They're not biblical, okay? Paul says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child, I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, there's only childhood and adulthood. Biblically speaking, you're either a child, you're a man or you're a woman. There's no middle adolescence ground, uh, a, a domain where you could just wreck the car as a 17-year-old, and I understand because that's just what teenagers do. Some of you have your standards too low on what you expect from your children. May I remind you that Daniel and his three friends were teenagers, and Daniel purposed in his heart at about 13 years old that he would not eat the king's meat. May I remind you that Daniel was put through three years of Nebuchadnezzar's wicked university and school, that they change his name, sought to change his diet, change his environment, took him away from his family, talk about peer pressure, and those four young men, because they remembered their creator in the days of their youth, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, they were able to stand under some of the greatest pressure that a Christian can face. Daniel, even when he was commanded not to pray, not only prayed, but prayed three times a day with his windows open. That's a man that fears God. And he was pretty young, by the way, when he did that. So I, I would start there, brother. And, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of time, I would just start right now with reading through the Proverbs a day with the family. Over time, you'll don't, 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 don't get caught up in I don't understand it. Don't get caught up in that, guys. Step one is just read the scriptures. Just read it together. Over time, your mind is going to begin to understand more of it. Don't get discouraged if you don't understand it. Or the, and don't get into this mindset, well, my kids don't understand, so it's not worth doing. No, no, no. The Bible, remember now, it's the Spirit of God that brings the new birth. We are born again by the Word of God. All right? So uh, hold one second, guys. I'm getting a very important call that I do need to take. Okay, I think it may have been a misdial. You know, sometimes people call you and they didn't plan to. Um, I just want to make sure everything's okay. Daddy. Uh, hey, Jojo, come here, Jojo. Josiah. Yeah. Are you not supposed to come through that door? I want you guys to lock that door, turn on the outside light, only come through the back door. Okay. Is everything okay? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, yeah. So, Brother James, thanks for that question. Nakeem says, got to go again. I'll catch what I missed in the replay. Yeah, no problem, brother. No problem. I'm going to go probably until about 930. Um, what time did we begin? I began at 8. Yeah, I'm going to probably go until 930. All right. So, um, I, listen, this is more for you guys. I come with an agenda of things I want to share and what I want to teach. But your responses and your questions bring to life the information, right? This is how it was done in the synagogues. This is how Jesus was able to walk into the temple, open up the scriptures and read it. You can't do that in our churches today. That was very interactive, and that's kind of the best way to learn, right? And so just lecturing, I don't know what you're getting from what I'm sharing. And so I, I like the interaction and like your input. Uh, Nick, uh, Nicholas says, thank you for that. I'm gra grappling with this currently as it relates to what is real and what is false in the church today. Yeah, the best way to know what's real and false is to know the Bible. The more we spend time in the Bible, not, not, not just in books, the more clarity we get. And the Bible says discernment comes, Hebrews chapter 5, by those who have their senses exercised to learn, right? That's a gymnastic term. That's, a, that's like working out in the gym. The way to grow in discernment is to keep exercising judgment, right? And so the more time you spend in the Bible, the better you'll get. Uh, would it be great if you, Pastor Sean, could go into the NAR comp and teach them about prophets and apostles since many of them believe that they are. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen circles. You know, I work in Christian radio as well. Uh, I have a music ministry with my twin brother. I get a chance to preach in a lot of different circles all across different denominations. And uh, there are some people who are hardened 
in their heart, in the way they see certain parts of the scriptures. And so it's very difficult for them to see, to see different, differently. Do you think that China will go to war against you at the United States? Uh, that's a very good question. I don't know if I, if I think that's going to be the case. I think there are people who read prophecy and they see, uh, they see China. Um, you know, the, the, America is described as, as the eagle in the Bible, and it's an interesting study. Um, I believe my view is that America will be the last opportunity for the world um, in in the way the gospel is given. Even with all of our flaws and all of our failures and all of our rebellion as a nation and all of our disobedience, I still believe God's hand is all over this nation. This nation gives more than any other nation in the world. Yes, she is more prosperous than many. Um, but we can go on and on about uh, all the things that God has done through and is still doing through America. Uh, Ian says 10. I'm not sure what 10 means, Ian. Um, are you telling me to go and tell 10? I'm not sure what that means. Um, Ian says, please do a, a tweens and teens question and answer. You know, yeah, I, I love, you know, I have a teenage, I have a teenager and I've raised three uh, 20 something year olds now. Uh, so God is blessed with a lot of insight. Uh, Brother Mike, good to see you. Mike had a chance to do some teaching with some men tonight. Mike, I'd love to hear more about what you shared. And uh, so what I want to do right now then, since I don't see any any more um, comments or questions that are relevant to the topic, let me, let me talk a little bit about Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And maybe you haven't seen Jesus this way. So first of all, this idea of Christ as prophet, priest, and king was developed in the fourth century. And then uh, John Calvin captured it and made it a threefold teaching on Christ as prophet, priest, and king, all right? And so as prophet, Jesus is the word of God. He speaks the word of God. He teaches the word of God. As priest, he intercedes or he's the intercessor on behalf of his people. He prays for us. And as king, he rules over God's world, okay? So I want to say something right now as we begin. Uh, and this is to men who God has called you to be the leader in your home. I want to say this, that leadership, leadership adjusts to its followers, not followers adjust to leaders. This is not true in every case, but I want to make the point here. Jesus as prophet, priest, and king, you'll see his leadership adjusting to the people that he's dealing with. Right. As opposed to the people have to adjust to the leader. So there are times as a prophet with some of your children, men, more the prophetic mantle is going to be seen. Right. You're speaking truth to that child who maybe doesn't fully understand the need to walk in truth. And maybe they, they, they tend to lean more towards compromising. Right. Then there's the priest role and then there's the kingly role. I don't want to go too deep on any of this yet. Let's first of all talk about Jesus as prophet. All right. We know that Jesus was a prophet because in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, the Bible says, as the people questioned Jesus's authority, as they questioned his teaching, it says that they said, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren? He has four brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Yes, Jesus had a brother named Judas. We call him Jude now. All right, he wrote the book of Jude. He didn't want to be identified as Judas because of Judas Iscariot. But Jesus had four brothers and at least, uh, I just believe, one or two sisters. But what was interesting is Jesus was rejected even by his own household. And so, men, you've been called to be a prophet, priest, and king in your home. If Jesus can be rejected, then you need to humble yourself if your families are not celebrating your authority, if they're not excited to sit down with you with an open Bible, if they're not encouraged to allow you to lead them, if your wife is not singing your praises, big deal. Do the job anyway. This is where you act masculine and not feminine. This is where you do what needs to be done regardless of how anyone feels, but you do it in love. You do it with tenderness. You do it with meekness. You do it with gentleness. You do it with long suffering. Just because you don't care what anyone thinks doesn't mean you are to act in a way that says to them you don't care what they think. Did you get the difference? 
We're to walk in the fear of God. That means the smiles and the frowns of others should not control what we say and do when God calls us to do it. The Bible says the fear of man is a sneer. So we're to walk in the fear of God. We're to be concerned about God's smile and God's frowns more than the smiles and the frowns of our wife, of our children, of our peers, of our friends, of our co-workers, of the people that work for us. And this is not easy to do. This is why we have to have our own devotional time where we pray and ask God to fill us with his spirit. Man, every day you should pray for God to fill you with your spirit. How many of you saints in the chat, if you pray daily for God to fill you with his spirit, please type a yes in the chat. Every day, without question, when you remember, I shouldn't put that qualifier, I did say without question, you pray every day for God to fill you with his spirit. If you do that every day, type a yes in the chat. If you don't do that every day, type a no in the chat. Jesus says in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. He says in the book of Luke, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father, your heavenly father, you are a Christian already. You have the spirit already. Yet Jesus says, how much will your heavenly father give the spirit to them that ask? Yes, Everyone that's been baptized into the body of Christ has been baptized by the Spirit of God into the body. 1 Corinthians 12. If anyone has not the Spirit, he does not belong to Christ. Romans chapter 8. But just because the Spirit of God baptized you into the body, just because the Spirit of God resides within you, doesn't mean you're filled with him. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 5, be filled. In the Greek, be being filled. Always be being filled. Don't just get filled once. Most of us, me included, we're leaking every day. So every day you should pray. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. Marcy says, I pray every day to be filled with the spirit. Phil says, I pray every day to be filled with the spirit. Side up says, no, I don't. I know you're going to start doing it now. Agnes says, I do it every day. Nick Nicholas says, I don't do it. G guys, thanks for transparency. Pray every day. God, fill me with your spirit. Every day I say, Lord, fill me with wisdom. Fill me with, with your power, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Give me more of your grace. Give me more favor with God and man. Why? If Jesus grew in favor with God and man, if Jesus increased in wisdom, Luke 2.52, if Jesus had the grace of God upon him, Luke 2.40, how much more should I pray every day for wisdom, for grace, and for favor? Many of us are not seeing the results that we could. Because we're not asking God for grace. Pray every day. God says, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and, quote, find grace to help. Grace helps us in times of need. So every day you should be praying for wisdom. Every day you should pray for wisdom. Every day you should pray for grace. Every day you should pray for favor. Pray, God, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Why? Isaiah chapter 11 says he is the wisdom. wisdom he's the, the spirit of God is the, is the spirit of counsel and might and knowledge, and understanding, and wisdom, and the fear of God. When you pray to be filled with the Spirit, you walk in wisdom. You walk in the fear of God. You have the counsel of God. You have might and power operating in your life. I can't emphasize this enough. Man, if you're going to be men in your home, you need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Church, after the Bible commands the church to be filled with the Spirit, guess what comes next? Wives, be subject, be submitted to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Chapter 6, servants, obey your masters. Children, obey your parents. The Bible is showing you cannot do what God commands you to do unless the Spirit of God is controlling you or unless you are submitted to the Spirit of God. For without Him, we can do nothing. All right? Faith says, do single female parents apply this same teaching in their homes with rebellious male teenagers? Yeah. Yeah. If you're a woman in your home, if you weren't here at the beginning, I said every child of God is called to be prophet priest, and king uh, in their domain. But what we're focusing on is why our homes are so shattered. Because the enemy understands the authority and the power that God has given to the man being created first. And the way he is physically wired, emotionally wired, the way he is built by God to lead, to focus only on one thing at a time. Right? Men have a unique wiring from God, to lead their homes, to lead their families. And so, yes, faith. I grew up with a single mother, as you know. Deborah grew up with a single mom. Uh, my mother did well, you know. 
Uh, we didn't have devotions every day in my home, but my mother sat down with us at least one day a week and read the Bible together. We went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, right? So she made sure we were in the house of God regularly. She was busy as a working mom. She didn't understand the things I'm sharing today and that she should open the word of God with her children every day. I say to single mothers, open the word of God with your children every day. Teach them the Bible every day, right? Why? Because your words have no power. Your words have no power. It's only God's words that can change the heart of a rebellious teenager, right? The Bible says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You're dealing with spiritual domain, and only the authority of the word of God can break those yokes. It is the anointing that breaks yokes. It is the anointing that breaks yokes. And that anointing is connected to the power of the word of God. Why? Because the spirit wields the sword. It is called the sword of the spirit. It is the word of God that has life. And so, yes. Uh, even though our mean address is to men and to women who want godly men and to women who are married to men that want them to fulfill this high calling of prophet, priest, and king. I want to say that even if you're a single woman, you can apply this as well. We got a few other people saying that they also pray every day for God to fill them. We got a couple of no's. Guys, thank you for being uh, transparent. You know, the whole purpose of this is not just for us to get information and revelation, but for us to have application to our everyday living, right? Uh, if you have grown since you've been part of the Grow in Wisdom family, for those that are new to Grow in Wisdom, we've only been around since February. If you're new to the Grow in Wisdom family, would you please put a yes in the chat? If I mean, if not, not let me say this again. If 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 since you've been part of our the Grow in Wisdom family, you've seen change in your life, maybe change in your home, change in your marriage, change in your finances, some area of your life has been impacted tangibly. Please put a yes. Um, in the chat. So people who are new to our family uh, can see why they should join, right? James says, no, but from this day, I sure will pray for the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, you know, because we think like Greeks and Romans, James, we think when we hear be filled with the Spirit, we think fill means be at the top. But in Hebrew, the idea is keep overflowing. Everything God does is abundance, right? Exceeding, God can do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask, think, or imagine. And so when we think fill, we think it's a one-time act. I did something once. I, 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 just, I repented once and I'm done. No, repentance should be a way of life. Being filled with the Spirit should be something we're praying for daily. Okay? Tasha says, I need to and I will from this day forward cause because I need it more and more every day. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to do stuff in our own strength. And, guys, we're weak, man. We're frail. We're frail. Uh, in, my, in my opinion... The reason why Christian men do not lead at home, because most of the pastors, oh, let's see, <laughs> let's see, my, my eyes are, are, are glossing over a little bit here. What's going on, man? Let's see. Most of the pastors did not teach them how to study the Bible and teach the Bible and how to be a spiritual leader. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, God says to Timothy, I want you to 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 take what I've given you. And I want you to commit this to faithful men. I want you to teach other men to do this. And so, yeah, you're right. Uh, pastors, um, many have, have not understood that we have a responsibility to teach and to disciple others. I would go deeper and say, brother, that because we've lost sight of what discipleship is and we treat discipleship as the same as missions and we treat it as the same as evangelism, because we don't understand discipling people uh, this is why there's so many people that are not as spiritually mature in their knowledge of Scripture and in their living. And so, yes, that that breakdown is seen in our homes and everywhere else. I would also say there's not enough pastors. There are a lot of pastors that only read the Bible so they can teach the Bible. They don't read the Bible. They don't have a devotional life for themselves. I'm sad to tell you this. I'm sorry to tell you this. There are pastors that don't do normal prayer. They just pray for their, 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 their uh, sermons. They pray for their church. But their own individual walk with God is lacking, right? There are a lot of pastors that will admit to you, I, I read the Bible so I can prepare sermons, not to feed my own soul. And, and Paul says, take heed unto yourself and then to your doctrine. You got to take care of you first before you start developing and hammering out theology to go and teach other people. And I, that's a warning to me as well, to everyone. And so, yeah, a lot of pastors are not passing on what they themselves have not developed. And so I don't knock them for not passing it on if they don't have it. You can only pass on what you have. You can only, you can only demonstrate by example what you're living, 
right? And so if you're not doing devotions in your home, how are you going to do a sermon series to your church that they should have regular daily devotions, right? So you're totally correct there, right? Ian says, uh, oh, your daughter's 10. Okay, sometimes I forget the questions I ask. Oh, that's great. I have a 10-year-old. We need to get together. Uh, invite me over for a barbecue. I like to eat, Ian. Come on, invite me over, brother. I know you know how to handle that grill. Come on. What, uh, you know, the summer's coming, you know? It's been a while. Invite me over. I'll bring the girls, All right? That's my way of wisdom. That's my way of not having to handle the grill. Uh, Phil says, yes, my devotional time has increased uh, majorly since being a part of the Growing Wisdom family. Thank you, brother. Ian says, yes, I need Jesus every day. We all do. Sylvia says, yes, she has grown. Nicholas says, Nicholas says, yes, I've grown. Ashton says, good night. Hey, good to see you, brother, all the way from the Bahamas. Thank you for being here. Uh, good to see you. Shireen says, most definitely yes. I'd love people to hear how you guys have grown since you've been part of the Growing Wisdom family. Because here's the truth, and I'm not doing this to highlight my gifts or anything else. And it is a gift, right? You can't, you can't rejoice in a gift because it's given to you. But here's the truth. A lot of people could be in church for 10 years, 15 years, and see limit, limited and, 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 and very little growth, right? Uh, and yet you could be exposed to somebody online for, I don't know, two months, three months, and you see unbelievable change in your life, right? Uh, and the reason for that is God has given different people different gifts, right? And so there's nothing to boast in except Christ, right, and him crucified. Uh, Marcy says, yes, I have grown since listening to your daily nuggets. I continue to grow in wisdom. Thanks to, thanks for all the teachings and the knowledge. Marcy is one of my, my great buddies. She's actually part of my church. So it's, <laughs> it's interesting that she gets to see me at church every week, and yet she still is part of my family uh, online. Uh, Faith says, yes, I've grown. James says, yes. Tasha says, yes. All right. Second Timothy 2 Timothy 2.2. Yeah, it says you're to commit these things to faithful men who can teach others. Thank you, brother. I can tell you know the word of God. Side up, side down. Say, yes, I read every day. Uh, I have a devotional plan, Proverbs and the Psalms before I was reading not as much. Yeah. One of the things I did for years, guys, is, guys, is I would read five Psalms a day and one proverb a day. Generally, I go through about 10 chapters a day. Right. So if you think, man, he really knows the word of God, and, and you may think, oh, he just knows the word of God because he's a pastor or he's a minister. I, I, I knew the Bible before I, I held an office. I hold an office because I knew the Bible before I held an office. All right. I'm saying all that to say all of us can be as spiritual as we want to be. All of us can be as spiritual as we want to be. You should type that in the chat. I can be as spiritual as I want to be. All we can decide today. I'm going to make adjustments. Right. People make decisions about their physical health. Why would you not make decisions about your spiritual health? Right. Right. Make uh, So. So Jesus was uh, back to the text. Matthew 13, 55. It says, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Jude or Judas and his sisters? I said he had one yet a number of sisters. We don't have their names identified in the scripture. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then has this man all these things? In other words, where's all this coming from? And then verse 52 says, 57 says, and they were offended. The people were offended by Jesus. But Jesus said unto them, a prophet is, with, is with, without honor, is not without honor, except in his own country and his own house. Jesus was not just rejected in his home. Jesus was rejected by his country. Stop whining if your family rejects you. So at least your country hasn't rejected you. That's a word for some men who said, all right, if you don't want me to teach you, I've been there. Like when I would have challenges with my family and getting everybody together for devotions, there are periods where I wanted to do that little whiny thing. Like, okay, if you guys don't want me to teach you that, I'll just, I won't teach you that. All right. And God had to slap me up a couple of times and say, have broad shoulders and be a man. Act like a man. Act six, uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Act like a man. There is what's called manhood and masculinity. And that admonition in 1 Corinthians 16 was to all the saints. Yes, women, there are times when you have to act like a man when dealing with the spirit realm, when dealing with the devil, when dealing with charismatic chaos, which is the first 15 chapters of 1 Corinthians, you have to act like a man when you get to chapter 16. Some of you will understand what I'm saying there. All right. So this idea of feeling, well, I'm just going to adjust because no, 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 don't adjust men, be men. All right. So Jesus was a prophet. We also know that Jesus is identified as our great high priest. The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 14 and 15, seeing then that we have a great high priest 
that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Right? Sylvia says, I can be as spiritual as I want to be. Amen. We all can. None of us have a smaller Bible than John Wesley. None of us have a smaller Bible than Charles Spurgeon, David Brainerd, Charles Elliott. I mean, John Elliott, Jim Elliott, right? Whoever your favorite guru is. We all have the same amount of time. We all have the same size Bible. We have the same 66 books. And all it is is prioritizing, making adjustments, just choosing. I'm going to block out 15 minutes a day, every day, to read the Bible for myself. I'm going to block out 15 minutes to read the Bible with my family and pray. That's 30 minutes of your day. That's not a lot of time, guys. We waste a lot of time, if you're honest. Phil says, Sean, would you do a Christian men boot camp? I would. I would. Send me a message on what you're thinking. Uh, I would love to do that. Yeah, I'd do that. I'm planning to do some live events this year as well. Um James says, my heart has grown most since following you. Uh, your teachings have caused me to be more accountable and uh, harder on myself for not desiring the things of Christ Jesus daily. Wow. A lifesaver. James, you're encouraging. Brother Mike says, that's right. Act like a man, not think like a man. Yeah. Yeah. Act like a man. Don't just think like one. Right. Right. Uh, Steve Harvey has like what? Think like a man. Act like, think like a woman. Act like a man. Some, something. Some crazy. Right. Some crazy thing. So, so we see that Jesus is identified as a prophet. Jesus is identified as a priest. Uh, he's also described as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. First Timothy chapter six and verse fifteen says about Jesus, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. I love that word, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Right. So uh, interesting text in in Daniel chapter three. Chapter 2, you probably don't know that this term king of kings was not only used for Jesus, it was also used for Daniel. In Daniel chapter 2, it says, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, or a king among kings, for the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. So Nebuchadnezzar was a king among kings. Jesus is the king of kings. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And as prophet, priest, and king, he rules, and that's how he functions. So, now, let's jump into, I'm going to spend maybe another half hour, and I want to talk about how men how men are to be prophets, priests, and kings in our homes. I may just get through one of them tonight. We'll see. Let's start with the man as prophet. The man as prophet. Men, if you're going to be a prophet in your home, you got to start with Deuteronomy chapter 6. I read that earlier. We're going to go back to it. In order to be a prophet, a prophet has to speak on behalf of God, to the family, the word of God, which means as a prophet in your home, you need to know the word of God in order to speak the word of God, in order to teach the word of God. I'm sure. Are taught. You need both if you're going to impact your family. So God says in verse 6, and these words, which I command thee this day. I want you to notice that God is very masculine in his, in his demeanor. And you say, well, why do you say that? God, in his demeanor, when he's giving instructions, he's not comforting. He's not nurturing. He's not, it's not about how you feel. He is commanding this to take place. And the Bible is filled with commands. And Jesus says, the way we know we love him is we keep his commandments. Why do I emphasize that? There are a lot of preachers and teachers telling you and I, because we're not under law and we're under grace, we don't have to keep any commandments. After all, keeping commandments, they say, is a work. And it's works-based salvation. And when you keep commandments, you are trying to be saved by works. James would say, you can't see real faith without works. He says, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works, right? So he says, these words, which I command thee this day, number one, shall be in your heart. Men, if you're going to be a prophet in your home, 
You got to start with you. You got to start with learning the word of God. You got to start with memorizing the scriptures. I have sat with people who said, I don't have good memory. People, stop saying you don't have good memory. If you want to say that, just add the word yet to it. Because I still believe that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And where do we get strength? From his word, from prayer, from community, from worship. Stop saying what you can't do or what you are unable to do. Your words do have power. And as a person thinks in their heart, so are they. So these words, God says, which I command thee this day, number one, shall be in your heart. Number two, and thou shalt teach them or you must teach them diligently unto your children. I want to go deeper on the word diligent. Let's look at the Greek word for diligent. Okay, I want you to see. I've emphasized this a little bit, but here's the Greek word. I'm going to look at the Greek word here. And uh, this word means to sharpen, to teach, to pierce, right? To be pierced, right? It has the idea of to prick, right? And uh, it's interesting how that word is used, right? It gives the idea to me like it's not going to be easy to do. Look at how it's used in Deuteronomy 32, 41. If I wet my glittering sword, the arrow, the arrows are sharp. So, so God says, uh, I want you to teach them diligently to your children. The word diligence in general has the idea of rising early. It has the idea of finishing what you start. It has the idea of completing a task. It also is the opposite of being lazy, right? Diligence is one of those things we have to apply in many areas of life, right? Look at look at it real quick here. I'll just look at a couple a couple uh, places for those of you that have never studied the word. Look at Proverbs Proverbs ten four. He becomes poor that deals with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule. The slothful man does not roast what he takes in hunting. But the substance of the diligent man is precious. See, a lazy person will go out there and hunt, put on gear and do all the work, and then they come back and they don't complete the task. See, the diligent person values what they caught outside and they'll come back and they'll complete the task. The opposite of diligence is to be a sluggard, to be lazy. The soul of the sluggard has desirous and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Diligence is something God commands us to do in our walk. My beloved, seeing that you look for such things. What things? The coming of the Lord. Be diligent that you may be found in him in peace without spot and blameless. Right? With, it's with diligence that we're to add to our faith. Right? If you're going to grow in grace, it's going to take hard work. It's going to take diligence. It's not going to happen if you're just hoping. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. All right? So when God says in Deuteronomy 6, I want you to teach this diligently to your children. I want you to apply effort. You can't be lazy. You have to be intentional. You have to block out time. You have to exercise wisdom. Why? Because if you don't do it, everything else will steal your time. There'll be competing voices. There'll be calls you get. There'll be friends that show up. There'll be somebody to knock at the door. There'll be the mailman. There'll be something. If you're not making this a priority, I promise you, the enemy will do all that he can. The world will do all it can. And your flesh will do all it can to keep you from teaching the word of God diligently to your children. God says, not only are we to teach it to our children, men, but we're to talk of this when we sit down in our houses, when we walk by the way, when we lie down and when we rise up, God says we need to know the word of God of God enough so that we can apply God's word to every situation. When that child comes in and they say, Dad, uh, John in my class tomorrow is going to be called Jennifer. One of my students, one of my kids came home and said, John, who we, John, we've called John, John for 13 years. John is now going to be Jennifer tomorrow and they want us to call John Jennifer. What are you going to do then? Is that when you're going to have to research and figure it out? Or are you going to spend time learning the scriptures so that when these things come up, they are going to come up, right? You can now apply. Well, not this is not my opinion. This is what God's word says. God says that you shall bind them as signs upon your hand, and they should be frontlets between your eyes. God says, do everything you can to remember what my words are. Why? Because it's only my word that has life. It's only my word that can bring change. And it's so hard to remember the word of God because we're forgetful hearers. We have to do external things 
<coughs> excuse me, to help us. God says you should write them on the posts of your house and on your gates. And it shall be when the Lord your God shall have brought thee into the land which he swear unto your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you the great and goodly cities which you did not build. God's going to give you houses. Beware lest you forget the Lord. When I prosper you, when I bless you, when I multiply you on the job and everything else, be careful. It's not hard to forget the Lord. The church of Ephesus was in love with the Lord. Under the apostle Paul's ministry, by the time we get to the book of Revelation, they had left their first love. So as a prophet man of God, if you're going to be a prophet in your home, the first thing you got to begin with is yourself. You need to make sure you know the word of God. You understand the word of God. You love the word of God. You love the God of the word. That's priority one, right? You can do this in tandem, but that's important because there are going to be questions and things that your family will ask. And men, you have a responsibility, according to Ephesians 5, to wash your wife with the water of the word. How can you wash her with God's word if you don't know God's word? Men, don't leave this for the pastor. Don't leave this for the counselor. Don't leave this for the woman's group or for Beth, uh, whatever, Beth Moore or the people that are creating all this content online in books. You have a responsibility to do that. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, and I'm sorry, in 1 Thessalonians, right? I want you to notice how God makes a distinction between men and women. Second, first, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I want you to notice... Uh, these words, All right? Again, thinking of the prophetic role, men, as a prophet. The Apostle Paul says this, verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. They said, you can look at our life and you see a certain testimony, and then he says, and as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his children. Men, there are your three responsibilities in your home to your children. You are to be an exhorter. You are to be a comforter. And you are to charge them. That means you challenge your family to do better. You exhort them to be the best at school to be the best at what they have been called to for the glory of God. Paul says, as a father does with his children, that's how my ministry was among you. We exhorted, we comforted, and we charged every one of you as a father does his children. If you're going to be a prophet, there are some times as a prophet that you will provide exhortation, right? All scripture is profitable, right? For doctrine, reproof, Correction, instruction, and righteousness. Exhortation. You say, well, what does that mean to exhort? Right? The Greek word is para, uh, para, para, uh, parakaleo, which is the same word for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the paraclete. He comes alongside. Right? So this idea has the idea 43 times to exhort means to beseech, to beg. 23 times it's translated to comfort. 21 times to exhort. Eight times to desire, right, which has the idea that you want something more for someone at times than they want for themselves. As a prophet, your appetite for them, your desire for their change often will be stronger than their desire for their own change. Jeremiah as a prophet wept over Israel because his desire for what God would do and should do and could how God could bless them was stronger than their own was. And as a prophet, as a father in your home, you have to develop these type of appetites for your family, for your children. You need to be able to have vision where you can see what your children can be, who your wife can be. And that's what you are not only teaching, but secondly, you'll be praying for as a priest. The idea is to pray six times. It is to entreat three times, right? Right. To call to one side is the idea of exhorting. To summon. That's what you do when you exhort. Right to address, to speak, to call upon, which may be done in a way of exhortation, entreaty, comfort, instruction. It also means to admonish, which is to warn. Man, do you see the, the demand on you and your time? It has the idea of to console, to encourage, to strengthen. You see how broad the word of God is? 
And so when you look at this word exhort, how it's translated, the first place this word is used is in Matthew 2.18, where Rachel is weeping for her children, and they could not, they would not be comforted because they were not. God had judged them. Second place it's used, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. So the exhortation should, the goal of the exhortation should not just be to show your family they're wrong, but also to bring comfort to them, to strengthen them, to edify your wife, to edify your children, to make them feel better about who and what the God has created them to be. Man, this is a difficult task. The idea is to beseech. The Bible says in Matthew 8, 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion exhorting him, begging him, beseeching him. And what was he crying out to Jesus for? He was saying, "My, there's somebody that's sick in my home, Jesus. Please help us. Man, if you're going to be a prophet, there are times that your family will hear you cry for their change. And I'm not talking about in prayer. I'm talking about in teaching. I'm talking about in exhortation. And so as a man, being a prophet in your home, God calls you first and foremost to exhort your family. Then he calls you to comfort them, right? Comfort them. I had to learn this the hard way. A lot of times with my wife, my wife would be, I would call it complaining about certain things. And instead of me encouraging her and coming alongside her and comforting her, I felt the need to correct her and show her why she's sinning against God. And there are times when you need to be the priest and the prophet and you just come alongside, honey, I understand. Let's pray about it. It's going to work out. God is still in control. Men, let me say something to you women for a second. There are a lot of women that have a problem with being submitted to men being subject to men. There are a lot of Christian women. You have a problem with subjection and submission. These are curse words for some in the Christian church. Uh, I'm going to say that what God calls the man to do and be is a thousand times more difficult than what God commands you to do. All God commands you to do is to be subject to or to be submitted to someone else's authority. You know what God calls the man to? God calls him not only to head, Headship doesn't mean that he rules. Headship means he's responsible. Headship means that when Eve sinned, nothing happened in God's world. Nothing happened from God's perspective. The earth was not cursed. Nothing happened when Eve sinned against God. It's not until Adam sinned that God said, Adam, where are you? And women, I shared with these women yesterday when I spoke that you have a challenge with being submitted and subject to that man because he's imperfect. I need you to understand that that man will be held responsible for you and those children on the day of judgment. Man, God will hold you responsible for your household. That's why God says if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, then he cannot rule in the house of God. So man, as a prophet, God has called you to exhort. God has called you to comfort. And he's called you to charge. And what does charge mean? Right? Sometimes your family is not going to like you too much. Right? No, we can't do that. The word charge has the idea, it's the Greek word for martyrdom. Right? The Greek word is matune or matureo. Matureo, which is where we get martyrdom. Right? It has the idea of to bear witness, to testify, to bear record, to witness, to be a witness, to give testimony. Right? To be a witness, to bear witness, to affirm that one has seen or heard or experienced something. So to charge someone has the idea also of demonstrating by example. You're not just ruling over your house where you're commanding everybody to do what you say. You're also demonstrating by your living that I am testifying to tell you to do something that I am doing or I am seeking to do myself. Right? To give, to not keep back, to utter honorable testimony, to give a good report. The idea is also to implore, to implore, to implore someone, right? So the first time this word is used is Matthew 23, 31. Wherefore, ye are, ye are to be chargers or witnesses unto yourselves, and all bear him witness and wonder, right? So men, to be a prophet in your home, number one, God has called you to be a prophet in your home. It's going to require you to know the word of God, to love the God of the word, 
And now you are commanded by God's grace, right, to comfort, to exhort, and to charge your family as a father, from Paul's perspective, does with his children. And what are you, what are you, what are you challenging them to do? As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. Paul says, when we came among you, we were like a father with his children. We comforted you, we exhorted you, we charged you to be what God has called you to be. To walk worthy of God. For this cause, we were like priests. For this cause also, thanked God without ceasing. We prayed for you regularly, right? We believed that God was going to make you who we were believing God to make you. You know, one of the most encouraging things for me, I was sharing with someone yesterday, was uh, my son. I have one son, my only begotten son. He's 24 now. And for years, I felt like a prophet without honor in his own home. I felt like my kids at times would take for granted daddy, daddy's teaching, daddy's wisdom. I challenged all of my kids to be entrepreneurs. Uh, all of you should start something when you're nine or 10, have something of your own, pay for your own college because you make your own money. And um, some of my lessons I thought were lost on my son. So my son left at 18 to go to Liberty University. While at Liberty University, enrolled in the military. And that left him, caused him to move to uh, Virginia or Maryland, right? At 22, I would say at around 22 years old, my son called me and said, Dad, I just want you to know something like this. I'm going to paraphrase. It may not be exact. I think you're the wisest person I know. I understand, Dad, all those things you were teaching me when I was younger. I didn't fully embrace them. I didn't understand them. I thought you were being hard. I thought you were being difficult. Yes, there are times in my home where I made decisions for the family that not everybody liked. Sometimes my wife didn't like. He said, but dad, I understand. And now people around me are saying, I think he said maybe a couple months ago that people around him in the military are saying he's like one of the wisest people he knows. Guys, you don't know what that did to my heart, right? And I share that to say, there are times when you are going to be a prophet, which means you are called to speak truth. We're called also to live truth, which is not easy to do. That your family may not understand. You may be rejected in some form like Jesus was. And I hope you don't get too emotional and overly amplify to think you're a martyr. Like Jesus got rejected and I'm getting rejected and woe is me. And you're in some corner crying like a little wimp or a little baby. Be a man. I'm going to say, God says in due season, you'll reap if you don't faint. Some of you have been pouring your time and your energy into your children and you're not seeing the fruit yet. Don't worry. Keep trusting God, right? Notice Paul says in that passage we read, he says his goal for them was that they would walk worthy of God who has called them unto his kingdom and glory. He is praying and believe says, that's why I don't, I don't, I'm not ceasing to give thanks. Listen to that. He's not even saying I'm ceasing to pray. I'm praying, I'm thanking God for doing what I'm believing God to do in your life. And that's what you should be doing with your children. Some of you are married to what you can see with your eyes and hear with your ears. The Bible says that which is seen is temporary, that which is unseen is eternal. And so instead of just focusing on what you see with your children, which is rebellion, which is disobedience, which is disrespect, start thanking God every day for the change that God has promised he would produce by your efforts. Father, I thank you for changing the heart of my daughter who disrespects me daily, who dishonors me, who dishonors our name. Thank you for giving her a new heart. Thank you for changing her disposition. Thank you for changing her demeanor. Thank you for removing the negative uh, centers of influence from her life. The Bible says all prayer should be with thanksgiving. All prayer should be with thanksgiving. Do you pray and thank God in advance for doing stuff that has not been done yet? Or do you only thank him for things that have been done? You should be thanking God for things that have not been done already because you're not walking by sight. You're walking by faith. You're walking by faith. All right. So as prophet, man, God has called you to be a prophet in your home. All right. I'm not going to spend any more time on this. I'm just going to say this. There are some men in Calvinistic circles 
that wear this badge pretty well. Reformed, Baptistic, Calvinistic, right? Uh, covenant theology. You know God has called you to be the prophet in your home. And you have devotions. But you lack the priestly part. You lack empathy. You lack compassion. Here is one of the dangers. I want to close with this and then I want to look at your comments. There is a danger. There is a danger in having one of these and not all of these, right? The great danger for us is if we teach much but pray and govern little, we lose spiritual power, authority, and respect in our homes. You can know the Bible and teach the Bible to your families. But if you're not praying for your family and you're not governing and ruling over that home, which means you determine what people can watch at a certain age in your home, what type of music should enter your home, right? What type of devices and what age did they get devices? In my home, some kid, one kid got a phone at 10, another kid got a phone at 17. We don't believe in fairness and know that neither does the Bible. God says, if you're faithful and little, you'll be made ruler over much. If at 15, you are still irresponsible, why am I giving you a laptop? Many of you are not governing your homes like God governs the church, like God governs his people. So this is why you need the wisdom of God. You pray, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Every All scripture is profitable for doctrine. All scripture can teach you how to be a parent. All scripture can teach you how to handle finances. All scripture can teach you how to build a good marriage. Not just the scriptures on marriage. All scripture is profitable for teaching. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and what? In righteousness. So, men, yes, be a prophet in your home. But in order to be a priest, it's going to require empathy. Why? Because as a priest, you have to be touched with the feelings of the infirmities of your family, which means to that prophetic role and insight, right, and the authority that God has given you to learn the word and speak the word to your families, make sure you temper that truth with grace. Jesus was not just filled with truth. He was full of grace and truth. And grace comes through the priestly role. All right. So we'll dive into that deeper, Lord willing, next week. At this point, I want to look at your comments and uh, answer any questions that you have. All right. So uh, let's see. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew, not Greek. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Did I say the Old Testament was written in Greek? No, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, uh, and the New Testament, which is written in Greek, was written by Hebrew thinkers and Hebrew writers, uh, As uh, besides Luke. We know Luke was uh, Gentile. Shireen, yes, you can do all things through Christ, which strengthens you. So, okay, uh, 1986, thank you for your uh, feedback there. I'm not sure what you were correcting, but uh, you're totally correct. There was some Aramaic also uh, in the Bible. It's not just Hebrew and Greek. There was Aramaic in there as well, if you want to be more technical. Uh, Shireen says, we need to hide the word of God in our hearts so that we don't sin against him. And when we do that, we'll know what to do. Amen. Amen. I can't argue with that. Sister Bridget, it's good to see you are here. Uh, Marcy says, parents, better now than later to share the word with your children. My children are grown and out of the house, and it's been so hard to teach them about God now that the world has corrupted them. Thank you, sis, for being uh, transparent about that. Guys, the world is working overtime. The devil, the Bible says God never sleeps or slumbers. I say the devil doesn't sleep or slumber either. And uh, he's a prince of the power of the air. Ian says, amen. The enemy will do all of what you said. Pastor Sean, yeah. Brother, I, I love you, man. You're a blessing. Thank you, Ian. Can't wait to fellowship with you again. Phil says, this is powerful teaching here. I got to step up, gird up the loins. Yeah, man, we're the key to our homes. 90% of success is the male. 90% of success, okay? 90% of success. I was raised by a single mother, and so is my wife. So we praise God for single moms that are godly and love God. Uh, but, men, we we need to, we need to, to uh, we got to, we got to, we, we got to do better. James says, Pastor Sean, I love this teaching. Your exegesis of the scriptures tonight is spiritually beautiful. Uh, God Almighty knew I needed to hear this immediately because I was struggling in the very this very thing. 
Well, thank you, James, for your encouragement, because before I got on, an hour before I got on, I didn't feel like, two hours before I got on, I didn't feel like doing a teaching today. And I was debating when I'm, oh, maybe I'll do it Tuesday. I'm not going to do it. And then I reminded myself I have to be diligent and I have to be consistent. And many of you are getting used to the Sunday evenings. And so I want to be consistent with that. So, James, you've encouraged me by your words. I appreciate you sharing that my labor for you was not in vain. Thank you, brother. That's a great encouragement to me. Brother Mike says, amen, God holds us men responsible. Sorry, I keep I keep knocking out the plug for my computer here. When Eve initiated sin, right, uh, and ate from the tree and gave to Adam, God didn't say, Adam and Eve, where are you? He said, Adam, where are thou? Yeah, you know, these are little truths that are jumped over or missed. You know, in this day of women's lib, which is where that has entered the church, feminization has taken over the church and the world. And so many churches now, women are leading everything in the church. There's not a, a great appreciation or biblical appreciation for, for the distinctions between male and female roles that God has identified and has not eliminated. And they're still the same uh, today, yesterday and forevermore. Jesus is the same. And so, uh, yeah, God says, Adam, where are you? He didn't say, Adam and Eve, where are both of you? Both of you have sinned against me. Where are both of you? I should write a book on that. Adam, where are thou? Right. That'd be a good book uh, to uh, uh, like a mantra calling men to their role and their position. Uh, Shireen, do me a favor. Message me or email me. Remind me to write something on that. If you're still here, uh, that idea of, of Adam, where are thou? That's that's a good title. Maybe I'll start with a daily nugget of wisdom, which is how I tend to write books. I start with those nuggets and I develop it. So. Uh, remind me, sis, to do that if you can. Send me an email if you can. Sister Bridget says Proverbs 22.6. Yeah, that's train up a child in the way they should go, right? Uh, amen. In speaking to Aaron and engaging him, I definitely see the growth and maturity. Yeah. My son, one of the best things that happened to him is joining the military. That's one of the best things that happened to him. Uh, question. How can we encourage our husband to become the prophet, priest, and king if he is hesitant to do it? Uh, one way to do it, number one, is you do it through prayer. Remember, men move visually. Men don't move by sound. And women use too many words to try to move men. And you are in disobedience to God's uh, God's wisdom. First Peter chapter 3 says, If a man is not listening to the word of God, that you, without a word, don't need to influence him by words. You influence him by your conversation. That word means conduct. It also has the idea of speech, but it's it's more focused on your demeanor Right. Because men look at how women respond to them and how men, women act with them. And that is more influential to gen, to the average man who is wired like a man. Right. I got to make that distinction in 2022. Uh, and so I would say the first thing I would say is continue to pray for him uh, that, that, that God would make him into this kind of a man. Number two, pray specifically that God would send uh, a, a God says we should pray for laborers. Right. That God would send laborers into his vineyard. So you can pray not just for, for laborers, for, for, for conversion, that God would save people. Pray, and I do this with my children. You know, I've had a daughter who is, uh, I thought, in rebellion or disobedience to some things. And so I just pray that God would send someone into her life. Sometimes your, 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 your prophet's without honor in his own home. People are not going to hear from you. Don't be surprised by that. If Jesus was rejected, wife, why do you need to make it into a big deal that your husband doesn't listen to you? Get over yourself. That's too much pride and ego. Lay that down. I'm not saying that's you, Sylvia, but somebody somebody needs to hear what I just said. With that being said, secondly, I would pray that God would send a man into my husband's life that would challenge him to know what it means to be a prophet, priest, and king in the home and would encourage him to do that. Thirdly, I would seek to give him this, this teaching, if I could, uh, and share it with him and get his thoughts on it. What do you think about this teaching, right? Uh, and then fourthly, get out of God's way. Right. Get out of God's way. Women, you are um, you are travailers. You are nurturers. You were made to birth things into existence. And because of that, you have a problem. Here's your vice. Your vice is it's hard to let things go. Why? Because you were made to give birth. And so you hold on to it until it changes. You hold on to it until you give birth. That's a plus when it comes to prayer and travailing for God. To save your husband, change your children, save your grandchildren, bring revival to your church. But it is a huge problem when you're trying to make your husband do something that he doesn't want to do. And you end up getting in God's way. All right. So you got to pray, Lord, help me to get out of your way. 
Even though it irritates me, it bothers me that he's not the spiritual leader that I know he could be, he should be. I desire him to be. You need to put your heart and mind on the book of Proverbs where God says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, God turns hearts wherever he wills. See, God is sovereign over hearts. And God is able to turn the heart of your husband and pray daily for God not only to change him, but to point out these truths to him. And guess what, Sister Sylvia? Guess who gets the glory when God answers your prayer? God gets the glory. And you will come back into one of these sessions and say, I've been praying for six months for my husband in relation to this area. And God brought someone into his life. God gave him a book. Somebody gave him a gift for his birthday. Whatever. God is sovereign. He can use anything. We never tell him how to do it. We just ask him to do it and get out of his way. So those would be my four encouragements. Number one, pray for him in general. Number two, pray specifically for God, right? You need to pray for him so your heart stays right, so your heart stays tender, and so you don't get bitter because he's not changing the way you know he can and should. Number two, pray specifically for God to send labors in his path. Number three, point out this teaching and see if he'd be willing to watch it. Introduce him to the Growing Wisdom channel. You know, if he gets connected to this channel, it doesn't have to come through this particular lesson. Over time, this this stuff is these are themes in my teachings, and I talk about a lot of the same things throughout whatever I'm teaching. And so, at some point, I believe God would allow him to get it. But number four, uh, get out of God's way, and be okay with God not working in your time and His time. Don't be like Sarah. Sarah didn't think God worked fast enough, so she went to her husband and she nagged him to go and sleep with her con with the concubine, and and the rest is history. That, 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 that nation has been a thorn in the side of Israel from then. Esau, Edomites, and now what we know as modern-day uh, Muslims have come through that lit line. Okay, so, so be careful when you're trying to make your husband do something. Remember, God is wiser, and you just got to pray and trust him. What time do you, your, does your Patreon live streams usually happen? Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, tomorrow is when we get on. It's every two weeks. Thinking about joining, but considering time difference, you're in the UK. Um, you know what? Reach out to me, Michael, because I, I do have some flexibility. That's the time I've been working with. I do want to serve as many people as possible. And we do have one other person that's part of the UK. That's part of our Patreon group now. Uh, I don't remember what their time time difference is. And so uh, if there's a time that could be better, let's let's discuss that. Because I think most of the people that are part of our Patreon now, they're, they're a little bit flexible. And here's the truth. Uh, when you find value out, out of something, you start adjusting your life to it. The people that are part of Patreon now, I think it's much easier for me to move it an hour ahead or an hour before for them because they have been benefited by it already. It's a little bit harder for someone new to, to decide to commit uh, if you don't really understand the value. Uh, Shireen says, okay, yes, Pastor, will do. You're a great woman of God. Thank you. Shireen says, Patreon members, Pastor Sean goes live tomorrow. IPM is to stand it. You're, you're the best. Thank you, sis. Sylvia says, yes, what you have said sounds exactly like me. Thank you for your answer. Well, well, you're blessed, Sister Sylvia, and thank you for being a part of the Growing Wisdom family. You know, guys, I love you all. I don't know many of you. Uh, I know those who are part of our Patreon. I know those of you that have been part of my Daily Nuggets of Wisdom, those of you that have been part of this YouTube family. And uh, it's been a blessing to get to know you, and I'm glad for the privilege to be able to help the body of Christ with the gifts that God has given me. I ask that you continue to pray for me, uh, pray for me to be that prophet, priest, and king in my own home. And um, I look forward to, to uh, those of you that will be part of our Patreon, Patreon uh, our study tomorrow. Uh, Lord willing, uh, next week we're going to dive deeper into the, the, the high calling, high calling for Christian men to be prophets, to be priests, and to be kings. And again, this call is to all Christians. All Christians have been made prophets and kings to God. All of us have been told to speak and teach the word of God, Matthew 28, right? We're all to, to know the scriptures, and we're all to have influence over the domains in which we live and the environments that God has called us to. But since we're focused on men, right? Some of you women, you're lamenting. You can't find godly men. You can't find good men. Well, I hope as you go through this study and you understand what that man should be, that his physical attributes— and the money in his pocket are not the only priorities on how you decide if he's the one. Make sure that this is somebody that you are willing to follow, right? That he can lead your home. Make sure that this is a man that will pray for you and your future children 
or your existing children if you're getting remarried and make sure that this person is a prophet, right? That they can speak the word of God. I want to say something here. That man does not have to know the Bible more than you or better than you. Some of you heard me say last week, my daughter's getting married in July. When she first met her now fiance, my wife and I did not love him for her. Why? Because he didn't know the Bible as well as she did. He was not as, I couldn't, I didn't see him as a prophet, priest, and king. And I was concerned about what my grandchildren would be like, right? Is she going to go to church and he not go to church? He was a professing Christian. He was a young Christian. But over the, the, he was also open to being mentored and he was patient. He showed over time, I really care about your daughter. And he was willing to hang around. And even to the point where he allowed me to pour into his life, right? And so what I want to say is your man may not be where you want him to be right now. Continue to pray for him. Pray with him. Support him. Women, when you encourage your man, he will jump over walls and run through troops. There's nothing more empowering to a man than having a woman at his side who believe he can do anything, who believe he is perfect with all of his flaws. She sees him as a king. Guess what, woman? Here's a nugget of wisdom for you. When you see your man as prophet, priest, and king, he will become prophet, priest, and king. Let me say it again. When you see him as he is, he will become what you desire him to be. Start encouraging him. Start thanking him for being a great leader in your home. Guys, too many of you are walking by sight and not by faith. You don't understand the power of the word of God. You don't understand the power of declaring things. It's not a coincidence that when... When Abraham, look at the patriarchs, as they were dying, they call their sons in and they bless them. And guess what happened? There was power in those words that bore fruit in the life of their children. All right? Don't let the charismatic chaos cause you to nullify the authority of God's word. There is still life and death in the power of the tongue. Just because the chaos has twisted it, and turn it into name it and claim it and all whole bunch of false doctrine and teaching doesn't mean you should avoid understanding what it actually means. And so an interesting study is to look at how the patriarchs bless their children and what they called them they became. Men, that's the authority you have over your home. Adam named Eve. The fact that he named Eve should be enough to know that men have an authority over women that's unique. But our culture, again, we, do, we want to bleed the Bible of its truth and dumb down these roles. And that's why our homes and our families are in disarray. All right. James says, God bless you all. Good night. Can't wait until tomorrow. Oh, James, so you're going to jump on that face Patreon teaching. Great. It's going to be awesome tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. Lord willing, I'm looking forward to it. Shereen says, when you see him as a prophet, priest, and king, he will become. Yeah, the way you know you see someone some way is how you talk to them, how you talk about them, how you talk with them, right? If you as a woman see your husband a certain way, he can tell by the way you respect him, by the way you encourage him. I was at this event yesterday. I'll close on this. So I spoke at this event in Brooklyn. I told you guys that. And uh, an elderly woman came up to me. She, was, she must have been in her 70s, 75, whatever. And she wanted to tell me how blessed she was by what I had taught. And it was such a blessing. And where's your church? Every time people want to know, where's my church? They want to come to my church. All right. And uh, and then she said something to me like, uh, this was an older woman. She says, our oh, women need to learn how to treat their men better. So my ears perked up. I'm like, let's go deeper. I want to hear this. She says, yeah, you know, our, 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 our young women need to learn, our women today, our women in our churches need to learn how to treat their men better. Like she started to emphasize the value of men and the value of godly men and why and, and how so many younger women and women below her generation and the, other, and the other generations don't see the value and don't appreciate them and don't encourage them. And she started saying they should encourage them. She should love on them. They should tell them how great they are and how good they are. And, Blah, 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 even with all their flaws. And I said to her, yeah, you know, the Bible says the older women are to teach the younger women. That's your responsibility to teach them, all right? And that's lacking in our in our day. So thank you guys for everything. Tasha says, what a blessed message. Glory to God for the victory. 
Phil says, good night, family. Phil, I can't wait to see you tomorrow night in our Patreon group. I hope you're going to be there. I know you were finishing classes. Well, you were sick, I think, last time. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. And uh, uh, guys, thank you for being a part of, of what we do. For those of you that don't know what the Patreon is, let me just show you that real quick, and then I'm, I'm done. All right, I'm just going to show that to you. If you go to Patreon, you should download the app. You know, there are three. There are Well, I have four levels in here. I'm going to shut one down, I think, temporarily. Um I just for sake of time. But uh, if you just go to patreon.com, right, and you type in grow in wisdom, uh, you'll find this page and you can sign up at the five dollar level, right, which says, hey, I just love the content you're dropping. Keep dropping it. I believe and support what you're doing. Uh, or you can sign up at the twenty five dollar level, which is the majority of people that are part of our group. I do have a hundred dollar level. That's for people that have like marriage issues and problems and they need marital help and counseling and blah, blah, blah. That's a higher level. But this is people who want to develop spiritually. Uh, we do monthly trainings. It was supposed to be just a monthly training. We meet twice. We meet every every other week. Uh, you get to be part of the Growing Wisdom family. At some point, I'm going to give access to my couple hundred sermons, which nobody has access to online because they're not online. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of things I'm doing behind the scenes for our Patreon group. And so one, it's one way for you. You know, I'm trying to create ways that you will continue to support what I'm doing. Um Financially, that helps me to be able to do more. And uh, and it also allows um, me to give you access to more things. So, Marcy, good to see you, and thanks for being here. Guys, have a great night. It's 10 o'clock. Um, I can't believe I went until 10. I mean, I can believe it, but I didn't realize how fast the time went. Keep 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 uh, this week in prayer. We're going to be dropping some daily nuggets of wisdom tomorrow. I think I have about one more week of old nuggets of wisdom, and then I'm going to start dropping. I have a lot of new stuff that I want to put out. I want to thank all of you that have been supporting my daily nuggets of wisdom every day and leaving comments and sharing them and liking and so on. That helps the algorithm and it helps the comments. So before you go out of YouTube, make sure you like the channel, make uh, su subscribe to the channel and make sure that you like if you've been blessed. All right. Hit like uh, that like button. That helps everything we're doing. All right. Good night to all. God bless you guys. And to all a good night.